Classes are still cancelled the next day. Some students don't come back from the calls with their parents and even though the names of the victims haven't been released, everyone knows what that means. Mooney, I swear to God, get back in bed. Sirius stands at the door, arms crossed over his chest as he stares down at a haggard looking Remus. I'm just going to get breakfast. We'll get you breakfast, you loon. You look like shite, get back to bed. In a turn of events that surprised no one, Remus had actually been rather downplaying how bad he was feeling yesterday and proceeded to spend much of the night and morning being sick. Moons, he's got a point. James finishes tying his trainers and stands up. There's no class, no assignments due. Give yourself a break for once, yeah? Remus shoots him a sharp look. Et tu, brute. <laughs> Christ, you're really up for blood today, huh? <sighs> Remus only turns his glare back on Sirius. I'm not moving. Sirius leans back against the door, one leg crossing over the other. Not until you get in that bloody bed, now go on! It is a face-off for the ages. Two of the most stubborn people James knows going head-to-head, -head, neither of them wavering. He's not even sure they blink. Okay, but guys, I'm hungry. Peter looks longingly at the door. James's stomach grumbles in agreement. This does not appear to matter to Sirius or Remus, both of whom maintain their positions like they're the royal bleeding guard. Peter starts inching towards the door. Maybe I could just sneak by? Not happening, Pettigrew. Sirius doesn't take his eyes off of Remus. No one gets to leave until Mooney gets back in bed. Trying to turn the room against me. Sirius grins, flashing his teeth. <laughs> They're already against you, my friend. Lie down and put us out of our misery, Moons. James earns a very rude hand gesture from Remus. My goodness. He clutches his chest dramatically. Hardly appropriate behaviour for a prefect. Remus crosses his arms over his chest, seemingly doubling down on his position. I don't know how many times I have to tell you I'm not an invalid. We know, but you've got a fever and you can't go five minutes without being sick. Ergo, bet. He does make a compelling argument. Shut up, James. James rolls his eyes, holding his hands up in surrender, leading to several moments of tense silence. Mooney. Sirius ducks his head in a move that James has seen him pull many times, just never with one of them. He stares up through his lashes, all bashful and pouty. Girls fall all over themselves for that look. For me, please. Personally, James thinks this is the weakest of his arguments, but apparently Remus disagrees. <sighs> Remus's hands scrub at his face before he eventually allows himself to look at Sirius again. Fine, fine. I'll stay. Sirius beams, practically bouncing around him to pull back the covers on the bed. Remus arches his brow. Eager much? To get you into bed? Always. Sirius gives him a wink that has Remus blushing something fierce, and James turns to Peter to see if he's noticed any of this, but Peter is already halfway out the door. Jeez, Pete, in a rush. James follows after him. You know how I am about breakfast! And to be fair, James does know. By the time he gets to the door, Peter is already at the bottom of the stairs. Wait for Padfoot, would you? Honestly, the Great Hall will still be there in five minutes. Sir James turns back to the room to see where Sirius is, only to find him perched on Remus's bed. The two of them are whispering, and then James sees Sirius run his knuckle softly along the side of Remus's face. Where's Padfoot? James jogs down the stairs into the common room. He said he'll meet us there. Come on, let's go before your stomach starts eating itself, yeah? He smiles at Peter, mussing his hair as he swings through the portrait and into the corridor beyond. James feels something warm in his chest as he thinks about the way Remus and Sirius were looking at one another. He's never seen Sirius so soft. Maybe he finally worked it out. The tosser. Why are you smiling? Peter looks a little unnerved. James shakes his head. Just thinking about how much bacon I'm going to shove in my face when we get down there. Oh, me too. James's high spirits decrease slightly as they walk into the Great Hall. The weight of everything that happened yesterday is unavoidable. It's in the faces of the students around them and in the empty spaces along the tables. They pass by Marlene, Mary and Lily. Peter waves while James refuses to make eye contact. He hasn't quite figured out how he wants to handle that situation yet. Are you two back to hating each other then? They sit down at the opposite end of the table. James frowns. We don't hate each other. We've never hated each other. Peter shoots him a skeptical look as he loads an extraordinary amount of scrambled eggs onto his plate. We haven't. James suddenly feels defensive. 
I mean, maybe you never hated her, but... Peter shrugs, moving on to the sausage. James crosses his arms over his chest, slouching slightly in his chair. She didn't hate me, she just... didn't... like me very much. Mm Mm-hmm. What did you say, mate? James keeps pouting for another few minutes before his stomach makes a noise that reminds him that Peter isn't the only one who's hungry. He's halfway through his first serving before he speaks again. Hey, I forgot to ask yesterday with everything that happened, but how did it go with your mum? She wanted me to come home. It took me ages to convince her I didn't need to. What? Why would she want you home? You know how she is. Peter waves around his third piece of toast. She thinks I'm in danger. She has a bad feeling. Being so far away from home isn't safe. Peter adjusts his posture. You know, Peter, I was homeschooled until I was 17, and I can do magic just as well as anyone who went to Hogwarts. Ask your father. There's no need for you to be so far away from me. It's not natural, surrounded by strangers. Who knows what kind of families they come from? Peter rolls his eyes. Leaning back in his chair and taking another massive bite of his breakfast. Did she really say all that? Peter nods. I'd love her, I do. But sometimes I think that woman has completely lost the plot. But something nags at James. What do you mean? Who knows what kind of families they come from? Huh? Peter looks up, brown sauce staining the corner of his mouth. I, I don't know. Doesn't want me hanging out with people whose parents didn't teach them manners or something. You know, troublemakers. <laughs> James bites down on the inside of his cheek to keep from being too loud. She must be thrilled you hang around with us then. Peter smiles a little shyly. You she doesn't mind so much. She likes her mum and dad. I think that helps. Serious though? Whew. One look at his hair and I heard about it for a week. Said there'd be no long-haired hippies in her house and I'd better remember that. Long-haired hippie. James is in near tears. He's holding his laughter back so hard. You have to tell him she said that. He'll hate it. Peter shovels eggs into his mouth. (laughs) Yeah, no thank you. Last thing I want to do is have to sit there and listen to him go on a tirade about what punk is. James smacks. Good point. Ah, speak of the devil. Sirius strolls up. Aw, were you talking about me? James, really? You do need to get yourself a new hobby. His obsession is getting a bit sad. James swats at him as he sits down, but Sirius ducks out of the way, pulling two plates towards him. Doing one up for Remus. Sirius nods. I won't bother bringing him much. Not like he can keep it down. But he's got to eat something. Toast, you reckon? James nods, turning back to his own neglected breakfast. And porridge. He likes the porridge, especially with the raisins and brown sugar. Good call, Wormy. Sirius stands up to reach towards the breakfast foods in question. There's a noise from above, and they all look up to see the owls arriving with the morning post. Finally. James's fingers itch to get his hands on a copy of the Daily Prophet, and by the looks on the faces around him, he's not the only one. We reckon they'll know anything we don't. Sirius watches the ceiling along with James. He shakes his head. No idea. Hope so. James's owl drops down beside them in a flurry of dark brown wings. His name is Hoot, which James thought was hilarious when he was 11, but it doesn't suit him at all. He's a very dignified owl, always holding his head up, keeping his feathers clean. Thanks, Hoot. James takes the rolls of paper out of his beak before tossing the owl a piece of bacon. He looks down like he's too good for it, but James doesn't miss the way he scoops it up when he flies off. Well? Sirius is still somewhat preoccupied, filling his two plates. Anything? Blimey, give me a minute, would you? James unfolds the paper and feels his stomach drop. There, on the front page, is a black and white photo of Diagon Alley. It's the emptiest James has ever seen it. The hanging shop signs, the only things moving. And on the road, surrounded by broken glass and rubbish, are several bodies covered with white sheets. Christ, that's grim. Sirius looks over his shoulder before turning back to the task at hand. James swallows, throat suddenly tight. Yeah. He flips the paper open to the article inside. Oh, shit. What? They have the names of the victims. James eyes the single column in front of him. They look so small written out like this, so insignificant, a whole life reduced to a line of text. James? You okay? James shakes his head, trying to get himself together. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Must still be half asleep. His eyes run down the names. He has no reason to be nervous. Everyone he cares about is here or accounted for, but that doesn't seem to stop his insides from twisting themselves into knots. Most of the names he recognises only in a distant way. A family he's heard mentioned once or twice. Someone's third cousin on the mother's side. 
until oh, he feels his friends turn to him, but he doesn't see it. Eyes still stuck on the page in front of him. No, is all he can think. No, that isn't fair. James? Sirius has forgotten the food. James has his full attention now, and he does his best not to crack under it. He forces himself to turn, to hold Sirius's questioning stare. No one's ever told him how to do this. He doesn't know if there's a right way, but he's almost certain there's a wrong one. Sirius, I'm so sorry. For a moment, the confusion remains. Sirius not able to make sense of what he's just heard. And then he's ripping the newspaper out of James's hands. Who? James cuts him off with one quick hand motion, watching as his best friend runs down the list of names. Watching him stop. He doesn't know what to say. He should. At this point, he should know. But words seem to have abandoned him. Sirius's hands are shaking when he puts the paper back down, elbows resting on the table as he drops his head. <laughs> James feels his heart squeeze. I... I should... I should have known better than to think... to think that I could... Peter grabs the paper from the other side of the table, eyes scanning down until they inevitably fall on Alfred Black. Third from the bottom, one of the last bodies found. It's my fault. It's my fault. It isn't, Sirius. This is not your fault. But Sirius only shakes his head, turning to look at James. It is. Yes, it is. They said the attacks were targeted. He'd never done anything, nothing, except try to help me. They killed him for it. Fuck! He leans back in his chair, pressing the heels of his hands into his eyes like he can force the tears back. You have no idea why they targeted those people. No one does. How would anyone have even found out that he was writing to you? I don't know. I... He drops his hands. I, I don't... The only warning is his sudden stillness. A second ago, he couldn't sit still, grief pulling at his skin. And now, suddenly stillness. Serious. But he's out of his chair, storming toward the doors like he's being chased. Where is he going? James only shakes his head. Oh, I did. And then he sees the back of Regulus's head disappearing into the corridor, and he realizes what's about to happen. Oh, fuck. It's his turn to jolt out of his seat, jogging down the length of the great hall. James bursts into the foyer, turning around, looking for Sirius. I know you did. You're being irrational. They're only a few paces down the hall, facing one another like they're about to duel. For the first time, Regulus isn't the one with his wand out. I bet you couldn't wait to tell her. <sighs> I told you. I didn't know you were writing to Uncle Alfred. But even if I had, I wouldn't have said anything. I don't believe you. Well, that sounds like your problem, not mine. You selfish, spineless- Okay. James steps in, grabbing hold of Sirius's arm as he steps towards his brother, whose wand, James can now see, has been expelliarmus to down the hall. That's enough, Sirius. Let's go. It was him! Sirius pulls against James's grip. I fucking know it was. You always were such a little snitch. Tell me, did she reward you? How much was our uncle's life worth? A new broom? A new robes? What'd you get on your knees for this time, Regulus? Regulus doesn't react to his brother's words, his expression completely unmoved. Is this how it's going to be, Sirius? You're just going to blame me for everything that goes wrong in your life? You're not innocent, Reg. You know that, right? Just because you don't cast the spells doesn't mean you aren't every bit as guilty as them. You stand there and you watch and you let it happen. And what's the alternative? Regulus. The younger boy steps forward, Sirius barely restrained by James's grip. Neither of them are paying much attention to him, of course. They never can see anything but each other when they're together. Should I be like you? Risk everything just so I can watch everyone I love die? Fuck you, Reg. James can feel the pain caused by Regulus's words running through him like they were a physical hit. He stares pleadingly at the boy he loves, willing him to look back, to stop. But his eyes are locked on his brother's. You chose this, Sirius. Sirius tries to raise his wand again, tries to get free of James's grip, and honestly, James doesn't blame him. Well, 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 what do we have here? Christ, can we catch a fucking break here? Rosier and Crouch saunter towards them, taking their places at Regulus's side. Though Reg looks like he's no happier to see them than James's. You wouldn't be trying to come for our Reggie now, would you? Crouch is dark-eyed and pointy-faced, sneering down at them as he twirls his wand between his fingers. 
James already feels the overwhelming desire to punch him in the face. Leave it. Regulus steps back. Let's go. But Rosia and Crouch are sharks, and they can smell blood in the water. Oh, are you upset? Did one of you muggle-loving friends get their heads blown off? <laughs> James slowly lets Sirius go. No longer sure he isn't about to whip out his own wand. I'd quit while you're ahead, Rosia. But the two Slytherins only seem to find this more amusing. You lot are going to have to get used to this, you know. Especially if this is the best your side has to offer. Evan gives them a derisive once-over. You know, I hear some of them begged. There's a nasty glint in Crouch's eyes. Can you imagine? Begging. Fucking pathetic. That's what happens when you mix with non-magical folk. Makes you soft. See? You lot? You lot are going to go one by one. And you want to know why? Well, I'm sure you're going to tell us. James feels Sirius buzzing beside him, ready to go off. Rosia steps up close. Too close, really. His ugly sneer getting right in James's face. Because you have no fucking claws. James does punch Rosia in the face then, at the same moment that Sirius sends Crouch flying down the corridor. You sure about that, Rosie? James gets Rosia on the ground before driving his foot into his stomach. What do you reckon, Padfoot? I feel pretty fucking sharp, Prongs. Sirius spells Crouch into the air before letting him drop back down again. Then he crumples to the floor. Enough! Rosia scrambles to his feet and pulls out his wand. James already has his aimed. Evan, I said enough. Rosia's wand doesn't drop. Regulus. This is not the time. Crouch only just manages to peel himself off the floor. James can't quite believe that they're going to listen to Regulus. Certainly doesn't believe it enough to lower his own wand. But to his surprise, Rosia steps back. This is a mistake. Your opinion has been noted. Take Barty back to the common room. At first, Rosia doesn't move glaring menacingly at James, who honestly has no idea what's happening anymore. Fine. Rosia drags his eyes up and down James's body one more time before he goes to help crouch off the wall. Well done, Reg. James wonders if they're going to have to do this all over again, but when he looks beside him, he sees that Sirius has lowered his wand. Really putting the black name to good use, I see. Is it bribery? Or have they just met Wilberger? Regulus stares at Sirius for a beat longer before shaking his head and turning away. Fire and ice, they are. Sirius can't keep his feelings in, and Regulus can't let his out. Either way, they'll destroy themselves if they keep going. James watches Regulus disappear down the hall, trying to swallow the tempest of emotions currently warring inside him. Come on. James nudges Sirius lightly. Let's go, yeah. But Sirius doesn't respond. Instead, he turns away and walks very determinedly toward the front doors. Sirius. James moves to follow. Just leave me alone, James. James pulls up short, watching Sirius storm out of the castle. James knows that Sirius means it. When all is said and done, Sirius really isn't that hard to read. Still, James struggles to fight the urge to start moving again. To follow him anyway. Which isn't fair. If Sirius wants to be alone, he should be allowed to be. It's just that James wishes that wasn't what he wanted. Maybe you should go check on him? James is lying on his bed, arm flung over his eyes. Is he still by the lake? He hears the sound of shuffling. Remus has been pacing back and forth in front of the window for what feels like hours. James has given up trying to get him to relax, and is counting it as a win that Remus isn't trying to go after Sirius himself. No. He's wandering around the third floor now. James nods. He's fine. He'll come get us when he needs us. But I won't. You'll be here when it matters. James stretches, pulling himself up to sitting and seeing that the sun has almost set. Speaking of, what time is it? Uh, I don't know. I lost track. James arches his brow. Yes, yes, I know. It's eight. Well, thank Merlin. Someone's paying attention. Ugh. James gets to his feet. Come on, Moons. I'll walk you to the hospital wing. Remus scowls. I don't need you to chaperone me, James. Yeah, but I'm obsessed with you, remember? James grins as he holds the door open. Remus looks down at the map again, worrying his bottom lip between his teeth. Remus. Eventually, the other boy lifts his head. We're going to take care of him, I promise. But right now, we have to take care of you. That isn't fair to him. He needs you guys. You should stay here tonight. Don't worry about me. I've done it alone before. Peter is reading Witch Weekly on his bed. Fat chance. I'm with Pete. 
We're going to be there, all of us. And then afterwards, we'll deal with the rest, okay? Now come on. Reluctantly, Remus does. The common room is almost empty tonight. No one feels much like socialising at the moment. Everything is just slightly... off. Nothing fits right. Nothing sounds right. As much as James is trying to hide it from Remus, it kills him that Sirius hasn't come back yet. That he's stayed away this long. Maybe he should have gone after him. So... Remus looks over at him. Their steps loud in the empty corridor. Lily. Ah. Uh, Remus almost smiles. I was wondering when she'd come up. James nods, shoving his hands in his pockets and not saying anything else for a bit. Do you think I should apologise? Remus arches his brow. I mean, you did beat the shit out of her best mate. Yeah, but in my defence, her best mate is Snape. <coughs> 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 Remus's cough is bad enough that they have to stop walking. Sorry. Don't be. You okay to keep going? Remus pauses, breathing in and out a couple times before nodding his head. Listen, I'm not going to stand here and pretend that I don't think Snape had it coming, or that it wasn't satisfying to watch you deck him. I knew we'd corrupt you. James grins, causing Remus to roll his eyes. But that doesn't mean that you weren't still acting like a brat. James scrunches his face. Let's go back to the part where you liked that I decked him. I'm sorry. But you know it's true. He called her. But James can't finish it, feeling the anger boil up in him so fast he thinks he's going to choke on it. I know. Look, give her some space, then go talk to her. You don't have to apologise for not liking Snape, but it might help if you at least admitted trying to strip him in front of the whole school was a dick move. <sighs> they come to a stop in front of the hospital wing. Fine, I'll consider it. Remus tries to hide his smile. That's all I ask. James smiles back. Well, I guess I'll see you on the other side, huh? Yeah. Guess. Remus turns to go but pauses before he makes it inside. James? Yeah? If Sirius doesn't want to come tonight, or if he doesn't show up in time, don't give him shit for it, okay? Remus, he's going to be there. Right. But if he isn't? I'm telling you now that it's okay. He gets to have tonight if he needs it, and I don't want you to make him feel guilty for that. <sighs> yes, okay, Mum. I won't nag him if he doesn't want to, but I'm telling you, he will. Remus nods. Thank you. Of course, Moons. Whatever you want. Remus arches his brow. Whatever I want, huh? In that case, I want you to fold oh, no. all the- Oh no, what's that? I, I can't hear you. James starts slowly walking backward. Remus rolls his eyes. Maybe you're speaking parcel tongue. I don't know, I'm not a snake. Yes. That's what I thought. See you, James. Always a pleasure, Remus. He watches the door close and feels something heavy start to grow in the pit of his stomach. Whatever Remus says, Sirius needs to be there tonight. It's a promise they've made to each other, to Remus, to be there every time. Every moon. It'll feel like a betrayal if Sirius doesn't show up now. But Sirius knows that. Understands it the same way James does. All that time they spent getting Remus to trust them, to let them in, that was part of it. Being there when it's the hardest. Not looking away from the scary bits. Not like his parents. The full moon isn't optional for Remus. Bad day, good day, he has to go through it. And so do they, the three of them. It's their job to be there, to prove to him that it isn't optional for them either. To prove to him that he's seen, completely and utterly, and that all of him is wanted. Sirius knows that. An hour later, James is feeling less certain. Prongs? I know, I know. James is standing by the window, invisibility cloak in one hand, foot tapping impatiently on the floor. Just give him another five minutes, yeah? He should have gone after him. He should have known better than to let Sirius stew on his own for this long. He should have dragged him out of that hallway before him and Regulus even got going. <sighs> James passes a hand over his face and tears his eyes away from the quickly materialising moon. Okay. I guess he- The door swings open and Sirius waltzes in. Not angry, 
Not flustered. He might even be... happy? James has neither the energy nor the time to make sense of that. Gents? Sirius nods to them. Thank Merlin. Thought you weren't going to make it. Come on, we got up. I'd give it a few minutes if I were you. That makes the hair on the back of James's neck stand on end. Give it a few minutes. James looks at Peter, who shakes his head just as lost, one the ready to turn into one tail. Serious. We're late. We have to go. We should have gone twenty minutes ago. But instead of grasping the urgency of the situation, Sirius drops onto his bed, crossing his arms behind his head and looking infuriatingly calm. Nah, trust me. We're going to be right on time. I... James really has no idea what's going on, and after floundering about for a few seconds, finally manages to speak again. Listen... If you don't want to come tonight, Mooney says it's okay, but I really think- I ran into Snape just now, on my way back. Sirius completely derails James's train of thought. I... Uh, okay. It feels like it did that time in the woods when Mooney went haywire. Wrong, James's brain keeps saying. Something is wrong. The way Sirius is talking, lying, in control and out of control all at the same time. Brilliant, was. Like fight, and I just saw it. Saw how we would prove them wrong. <laughs> that noise finds its way between James's ribs and pulls at his lungs. Prove them wrong? Prove who wrong? James shakes his head. Never mind. Tell me later, yeah? We have to go. But Sirius just smiles. It's an expression too sharp to be joyful. God, it's so fucking funny! So fucking ironic! Don't you see? Sirius turns his head. Looking at James properly for the first time. See what, Pads? They said we don't have claws. Still with that same smile on his face. But we have a fucking werewolf! The world stops. James swears the literal rotation of the earth freezes on those words. Cold dripping down his spine. Wrong. 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 We... You... Did you tell Snape about Remus? A question he never thought he'd have to ask and somehow Sirius is still smiling. Better than that. I told him how to get past the tree. James is running. No invisibility cloak. No secret passageways. He runs, feet slamming into the stone floors, chest heaving with the effort. He's never moved so fast in his life. Never felt so scared. So scared that he's not even sure this is real. That he hasn't just fallen into one of his nightmares. Wake up, he thinks. Wake up, wake up, wake up, please wake up. I told him how to get past the tree. It must have rained at some point because James slips on the grass as he hurtles himself across the lawn, lungs stinging with the cold air. There's always the chance that Snape didn't take the bait. That he saw it for the trap that it is. That he just minded his own fucking business for once in his miserable life. But as the willow comes into view, James knows that's not what happened. Knows it from the strange way the branches are holding themselves. Someone's pressed the knot. Recently. I told him how to get past the tree. James doesn't stop, doesn't slow down, throwing himself into the passage and towards the shrieking shack, barely breathing. It's late. They were already running late. He has no time. He doesn't know what he's going to do if he gets there and Mooney is already transformed. If he gets there and he's... He's... Fuck. He bursts into the shack, breathing heavy, pulse loud in his ears as he takes the steps two at a time. GET OUT! GET OUT! What the hell are you playing at, Lupin? What is this place? Please, please, Snape, I'm begging you, leave, just leave. James throws open the door to the bedroom with such force that it slams into the wall behind it. Remus has backed himself up as far away from Snape as he can get. He doesn't have his wand, of course. Completely defenseless, meanwhile Snape has his drawn and pointed right at him. James. James, he's... he's here, he's... Remus doubles over. Ah! What the fuck is going on? Snape turns on him pointing his wand in James's direction, but he ignores it, walking right past him and over to Remus's side. It's now. James. 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 It's happening now. You have to. He. 
He can Shh. It's okay. It's going to be okay, I promise. I'm going to take care of it. James wraps his arms around him as gently as he can, but Remus still flinches as James guides him back to the mattress. What the fuck is wrong with him? Remus is hyperventilating, dropping his head between his knees the minute he's sitting down again, his whole body shaking. You... you have to get... Ah! James wonders if one day that sound will stop feeling like broken glass. With a shaky breath, he turns to Snape. We have to go. No. Snape only glares, attempting to lean around James so he can get a better look at Remus. Is he mental? Have they let a fucking psycho into Hogwarts? Okay, you're going to move or I'm going to- James reaches into his back pocket for his wand and keeps reaching. And reaching. But there's nothing there. He forgot his wand. He forgot his wand. James doesn't need to turn around. He's seen it before. He knows what's happening. And if the new expression of horror on Snape's face is anything to go by, he does too. Move, you idiot. Now. We're going now. James steps forward to grab him, but Snape jabs the tip of his wand into his chest. A werewolf? The freak is a werewolf? Move. <laughs> James sees it happen. Sees the wand move from his chest to the boy behind him sees Snape open his mouth. Don't you dare. James doesn't think, he just launches himself forward, tackling Snape before he can get out whatever spell he's trying to. They crash to the floor, landing hard on his shoulder. What is wrong with you? They roll around, dust getting into James's eyes and mouth, an elbow to the face, a knee to the gut. He still ends up on top. At some point in the scuffle, Snape's wand is lost. He doesn't know where it goes. Get off of me! Get off! Get off! That thing is a fucking monster! Do people know? It's going to be a fucking inquiry. They'll throw you all in Azkaban! Get off of me! I would shut your mouth unless you want a repeat of yesterday, asshole. Lily's not here to rescue you this time. I- But suddenly Snape goes still, eyes growing to nearly twice their normal size. James nearly asks what's wrong with him when- Oh. Oh no. James looks over his shoulder and is met with a pair of glowing yellow eyes. He tries sometimes to look for Remus in them. He hasn't found him yet. He rolls off of Snape, just as the wolf launches itself forward, Snape scrambling out after him. They're nearly out of the room when Snape jerks to a stop. What the fuck are you doing? My wand. James doesn't wait, grabbing Snape by the front of his shirt and throwing him down the hall towards the stairs. I'll buy you a new fucking wand, now move. They make it to the top of the stairs before James feels a set of sharp claws sink into his back, throwing him into Snape. They all go careening down the stairs. James manages to knock Mooney off, but can't stop himself from falling the rest of the way to the bottom. Everything shakes. His hands his head. He's pretty sure the floor underneath him is shaking. There's blood. His face, maybe? Definitely his back. Somehow he manages to push himself back onto his hands and knees. Snape is lying beside him, face down. Snape. James shakes him and then sees the blood by his forehead. Fuck. Fear cuts through him like a knife. Snape. Snape. Severus. Fuck. James looks back to see Mooney standing at the top of the landing, seeming so much bigger than he ever has before, lips pulled back over his teeth. James's eyes dart around, looking for something, anything to fight with. They land on the stair banister. He hears the noise of claws on wood as he reaches for one of the posts and starts pulling. Oh, come on. He feels the rotten wood give. Come. On. It pulls off and James spins around, wielding it like a bat. Mooney is nearly on him, launching off the last step as James swings. A clean shot, right at the face. Mooney pulls away, but not far, and James feels his panic rising. What exactly is his plan here? How is he going to fight a werewolf with a piece of wood? How is he going to fight Mooney? The wolf's hackles are up, back arched as he turns to James again. Except... Except his eyes are on the post in his hands. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. James gives the wood an experimental wave and watches Mooney's eyes follow it. Admittedly, 
If this doesn't work, James will once again find himself defenseless in front of a werewolf. But hey, what's life without a little risk? Okay, Mooney. James waves the post around a little more. Okay. Okay, you want the stick? Huh? You want the stick, big guy? Praying with every fibre of his being that this works. Go get it then! He chucks the post up onto the floor above them and by some absolute miracle Mooney follows. James doesn't hesitate, bending down and grabbing Snape by the arms, dragging him towards the door. He can taste blood in his mouth. It feels like seconds, maybe less, before his attention is drawn back to the stairs. Mooney glares at him for a moment before spitting the post out from between his teeth. Fuck! James tries to move faster, the door to the passage just behind him, but Mooney is moving fast now too. Fuck! 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 He pushes through the door, yellow eyes coming right for him. He lets Snape drop as he scrambles for the handle, slamming the door shut and sliding the metal bolt across the top. James stays with his back pressed against it, breathing so heavy it hurts, sweat covering his skin. Mooney paws at the door, but the lock holds. James tries to exhale, tries to get some kind of control over his heart, his eyes trailing down to the body at his feet. Snape still hasn't moved. I swear to Merlin if you're dead. James stumbles beside him, his limbs not quite working properly. He can't tell if it's from the adrenaline or the stairs, but his whole body feels numb, which is probably a blessing. He rolls Snape onto his back, pressing his ear to his chest, trying to hear past his own thundering heartbeat. Come on, you bastard. He feels more than he hears Snape take his next breath, his chest rising and falling under James's ear. He pulls back, looking down at the nasty gash on his forehead that slips up into his black hair, covering half his face with blood. James brings his hands to his own face, assessing the damage. All right. James drops his hands, getting Snape's arm over his shoulder and holding him onto his back. <sighs> Merlin, you heavy. He starts to walk. It's hard. It takes longer than it should. James is pretty sure he's got some nasty bruises along his ribs and shoulder because every time Snape shifts on his back, he feels burning pain down his side. He prays to Godric that the wanker doesn't wake up. The last thing he needs is to have to deal with a hysterical Snape making things difficult. By the time he drags himself out of the Whomping Willow, he's sweating and shaking and only just makes it past the tree branches before dropping Snape onto the grass, hissing at the sharp pain that shoots through his shoulder. Holy sh- He looks up and sees Peter and Sirius coming towards him across the lawn. Even in the near pitch black, he can tell that Sirius isn't smiling anymore. Holy shit, Prongs! How's Remus? What happened? James ignores him, looking only at Peter. I need you to go calm him down. He's right by the door, so you'll have to transform before you go. Peter has only barely opened his mouth to respond when Sirius steps forward. I'll go. I'll- The hell you will. With everything left in him, James shoves Sirius back. You stay the fuck away from him. Sirius blinks, eyes big and swimming in moonlight. He looks lost. And for once in his life, James doesn't care. Peter, go. By myself? James gives him a look that is apparently enough of an answer because he doesn't bother arguing again, transforming into a rat and running towards the tree with his wand in his mouth. The quiet is heavy. Sirius and James just stare at one another, James still breathing hard. He doesn't know what he looks like. He imagines not good. James. And it makes James angry. What the fuck is wrong with you? How could you do that? How could... How could you be so fucking selfish? James watches Sirius flinch, curling in on himself. I don't know. You don't know. Well, that's brilliant, Sirius, really. You just... just thought it'd be funny, eh? A good laugh. Another one of your spontaneous pranks. Sirius isn't looking at him anymore. Eyes on the ground. Does he... did he see? He nods to Snape. Isn't that what you wanted? Sirius grimaces, but doesn't move his gaze from Snape's motionless form, like he's trying to convince himself it's really there. We could wipe his memory. Wipe his memory? James feels cracked open. You know how to do that, do you? I could figure it out. Sirius looks up at James, hopeful. I know I could. <laughs> and then what? It'll be like it never happened. You're going to wipe Remus's memory too. Mine? Pete's? Sirius's eyes go wide his mouth opening helplessly without any sound coming out. Suddenly James is exhausted. He doesn't want to deal with this. 
doesn't know how. It's illegal. James bends down to pick Snape up again. I'm not going to ask a man just so you don't have to deal with what a shitty person you are. He brushes past Sirius and towards the castle. Where are you taking him? Sirius jogs up beside him. Hospital wing. James, he'll talk. You know he will, and then Remus. Yes, I know. James has to stop again, struggling to keep himself contained, to keep himself from falling out of the holes torn in his skin. Sirius is looking at him with shocked eyes. James has never yelled at him like that before. He's not sure that he's ever yelled at anyone like that. I'm going to talk to Dumbledore. He went through all that trouble of letting Remus in. He's not going to let Snape ruin that. James starts walking again. He can feel Snape's blood soaking into his shoulder. Okay, yeah, you, you might be right. I'll come with you. No. James. I'm sorry, maybe I wasn't clear earlier. When I said stay the fuck away from him, I also meant to stay the fuck away from me. James, please, please. I, I just wasn't thinking. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You just weren't thinking. You're unbelievable. You know it's going to break his heart, right? James stops again, turning to face Sirius fully. I mean, it would have if it was any of us, but that it was you. You... It's going to destroy him when he finds out. For a minute, Sirius just stands there, looking small. Don't know why it matters that it was me. James drops his head. Yeah. He looks up again. Sure you don't. He turns around and keeps walking. He hears his name one more time, but doesn't stop. Poppy Pomfrey stands in front of him in a house coat and slippers, hair braided down her back. Her wand currently provides the only light in the room. James Potter, you better have a good reason for waking me up at- She squints. Is that blood? With one flick of her wand, all the lamps in her office light and she steps forward, bringing her hands to his face, inspecting the damage. Is it bad? I haven't seen it yet. James, what happened? Apparently in her shock, last names have gone out the window. It's a long story. Listen. He steps gently out of her grasp. I'm fine. It's... It's Snape you need to look at. She blinks. Snape? Severus Snape? James nods, leading her back out into the hospital wing, where he left Snape on one of the empty beds. Merlin. She quickly moves to his side. James, what on earth happened to you? Her eyes are on the body in front of her, wand running up and down, casting so quickly James can't keep track. <sighs> he sits on the chair next to the bed and wipes at his bleeding nose. He got in. Got in. He watches her wearily, hoping it looks worse than it is, that it'll be an easy fix. Remus will never forgive himself otherwise. Yeah, yeah, he got into the shack. Her hands still, her whole body stills really, eyes flicking up to meet his for the first time. The shack? James nods. He... Remus did this. Not on purpose, but yeah. He sees the fear in her eyes as they bounce back and forth between him and Snape reassessing their injuries. He didn't bite us. You're sure? James nods. This was the stairs, mostly. He motions to himself. And Remus? He knows that she cares for him. Maybe almost as much as James does. He's still there, locked in. He'll be okay. Or, well, he's not hurt too bad anyway. I don't think. If we didn't have our wants. James feels his stomach squirm, but he pushes all thoughts of how very not okay Remus is going to be out of his head. There are still hours until sunrise, and if he thinks about it too much, he'll lose it. You didn't have your wands. Her face pales. She just stares at him for a moment before eventually shaking her head. I have to get the headmaster in your heads of house. She looks at him and then quickly waves her wand. James feels the tingling sensation of her diagnostic charms. You should be okay to wait. Nothing severe. She starts moving away when James calls her back. He'll be alright. He gestures to Snape. She pauses a moment and then nods. A concussion, that's all. He'll have to take a potion in the morning for the next week. And then he should be good as new. <sighs> James feels his whole body relax. Okay. Well, at least there's that. You did good, James. James passes a hand over his face and winces as he brushes against the cuts on his cheek and forehead. He gives Snape a lingering look, hair now stuck to his face as the blood dries, Robes covered in dust and dirt. He hates him. He's not sure if he's right to in this moment, but he does. It's easier than hating Sirius. Eventually he gets up, moving to a chair across the room so he doesn't have to look at him anymore. He leans his head back against the wall, closing his eyes. 
He hopes that Peter actually went into the shack and isn't just waiting outside the door. He hopes that him being there helps get Mooney to relax. He hurts himself when he gets worked up, especially when he's trapped. He very determinedly doesn't think about Sirius, or where he is, or what he's going to say when he sees him next. The numbness of before is wearing off, and everything aches and twinges. And he's tired. So fucking tired. He has to figure out what he's going to tell Remus. How he's going to stop him from reverting back to first year. To a boy who smiles politely but doesn't say much. Doesn't trust anyone enough to give any part of himself away. Potter. James blinks his eyes open, not remembering hearing anyone come in. The world is blurry for a minute, but slowly, a looming McGonagall comes into view, mouth pursed, tartan house coat wrapped tightly around herself. Are you alright? She somehow manages to sound both concerned and brisk at the same time. Uh, sure. James pulls himself up straighter, wincing at the tightness of his muscles. The hospital wing is fully lit now, the curtains drawn around Snape's bed. He must have fallen asleep. Behind McGonagall are Dumbledore and Slughorn, both staring at James expectantly, while Pomfrey flits in and out in the background, moving between her office and Snape's bedside. Uh. James doesn't like where this is going at all. How? Precisely. McGonagall is clearly not in the mood for small talk. Did you and Snape find yourselves in the Shrieking Shack? James blinks up at her. Oh. Right. Questions. The Whomping Willow. Because James figures the more literal his answers are, the safer he'll be. McGonagall arches her eyebrow. And how did you know that the tree was an entrance? Remus. Remus told them. But James isn't about to tell her that, so instead he shrugs. Can't remember. <laughs> really? You can't remember. This is a time-tested method of the Marauders. When in doubt, amnesia is always an excellent defense. Nope. I see. <sighs> and why, may I ask, were you trying to get into the Shrieking Shack at all? James meets her eyes, gaze steady. I went to stop Snape. To stop Snape? Stop him from what? Really? He thinks. Is she really going to make me say it? Professor, he's one of my best mates. We've shared a room for five years. You don't think I've noticed that he always gets sick around the full moon? McGonagall looks more surprised by this revelation than he expected her to. Pomfrey, of course, now standing still in the background, does not appear the least bit shocked. For how long have you known about Lupin's condition? In for a penny? In for a pound. Second year. Not that he wasn't bloody suspicious in first year, but if they were going by the first time they got Remus to admit to it, that was second year, just before Christmas. Is it sunrise yet? James knows the interrogation isn't over yet, but he's not sure how long he was asleep for. He looks around McGonagall, trying to see the window. Not yet. Another hour still, then I'll go get him. You have to protect him. Potter. Snape is going to spread this around to whoever will listen. You have to stop him. You have to make sure that doesn't happen. He looks Dumbledore dead in the eye. He feels a little bad about ignoring McGonagall, but as much as he likes her, and he does, he's not interested in manners or rules right now. Dumbledore's blue eyes twinkle in the candlelight. I've protected him so far, have I not? I don't know. As far as he can tell, Remus has protected himself. But I need your word that you'll protect him now. He can feel Dumbledore's attention like a hand on his shoulder. Fingers digging in, squeezing, looking for something. But James doesn't back down, doesn't blink. You have it. Of course, Snape will be made well aware of the importance of Lupin's privacy, and of what the consequences will be if he violates it. Now, now, Dumbledore, let's not forget, Severus is the victim in all this. Dumbledore looks over at him passively. I dare say that there have been several victims tonight, due largely to Snape's curiosity. James nearly laughs at the look of outrage on Slughorn's face. But how did he know about the shack? McGonagall brings all eyes back to James. He doesn't know why he lies. Stupid, really. When Snape will no doubt rat Sirius out the moment he's conscious. And honestly, serve Sirius right. He's not interested in protecting him. 
Not this time. But for some reason, he just can't make himself... Sorry, I don't know. McGonagall stares him down, as if expecting him to crack under the pressure of her disapproval. In fairness, he's sure it's worked for her in the past. But James doesn't even fidget. You can return to your room now, Potter. James shakes his head. I'm not going anywhere. Remus will be in good hands, James. You have nothing to worry about. He smiles. But James doesn't smile back. With all due respect, sir. James leans forward, clasping his hands between his knees. One of my best friends just had to live through his worst nightmare. If you think there's any way I'm going to let him wake up alone, you don't know me very well. He feels the other three adults staring at him, a new tension falling over the room. James isn't stupid. He knows who Dumbledore is knows he's much more than the headmaster of a school. He's heard the things his parents have said, the way they look up to Dumbledore. And he does too, honestly, has the chocolate frog card and everything. But he'll fight him if he needs to. Eventually, Dumbledore smiles again. Quite right. Minerva? Horace? Dumbledore nods in the direction of Madame Pomfrey's office. A word? McGonagall does not look at all pleased about the way things have gone, but with one last look at James, she allows herself to be herded away, leaving him and Pomfrey alone again. Here. Pomfrey steps closer. Let's do something about that face, shall we? James nods, not paying much attention to the waves of magic that wash over him. Some of it hurts, but he registers it in a distant way, not really feeling it properly. Eyes staying the whole time, on the brightening sky outside the window. Do you know what they're talking about in there? James nods his head in the direction of her office. No doubt trying to figure out how to keep the Ministry after this. James snaps his head out of her hands. The Ministry? Why would the Ministry get involved? She's clearly unhappy to keep having her work interrupted. Well, they like to keep a rather tight rein on, you know. Werewolves. She frowns. You can say it, you know. I don't think it makes him feel better when people act like it's a dirty word. It's just... just a part of him, that's all. Not bad or good. Just there. James is worried for a moment that she's going to argue with him. He doesn't have much patience for people having a go at Remus on a good day. He certainly doesn't have the ability to handle it well right now. He's lucky to have you. James lets that sit with him for a moment before he shrugs. Actually, I think we're the ones lucky to have him. She smiles softly at him, and together they watch the sun come up. When Pomfrey comes back from the shack an hour later, it's with an unconscious Remus floating beside her, and James is up and at his side immediately. This isn't right. You should be awake. Pomfrey sends him a sidelong look as she folds back the covers of the nearest bed and lowers Remus into it. It used to happen a lot before. Before? She nods, tucking Remus in. When he was younger, it would take him quite a bit longer to wake up. Right up until the latter half of his second year, I would say. She sends him a meaningful look across the bed, but James still doesn't understand. Why, though? He takes the chair beside Remus's bed. She runs her wand over him and fixes the smaller nicks and bruises before brushing the hair back from his forehead. There's not much work that's been done on lycanthropy, but from what I can tell, it helps if you want to wake up, want to come back to yourself. James isn't sure which part of that hurts more. The fact that 11-year-old Remus didn't want to wake up, or the fact that 15-year-old Remus doesn't want to wake up. Without thinking, he reaches out and takes Remus's hand. Is he... I had to hit him. To get away. Is he... He's alright. A few bruised ribs. Nothing he hasn't had before. Which James knows is meant to be comforting, but isn't at all. Right. He squeezes Remus's hand a little more tightly. Just give him time, James. She goes to leave, closing the curtains around them. James is glad that none of the others come in. Glad that when Remus wakes up, he won't be surrounded by a bunch of unwelcome faces. It's strange thinking about it now, that Christmas in second year. James and Sirius had been certain for months, but Peter still wasn't convinced. What if we're wrong? What if he gets offended? But all they cared about was being right. Being clever enough. 
observant enough to spot it. They tease Remus about being a SWAT, but the truth is, it was James and Sirius who were obsessed with being the brightest, the most talented, top of the class, who wanted to be seen. They hadn't once considered what it would mean for Remus, for people to know, or how unfair it was not to let him tell them himself. The day before they were due to leave on Christmas break, the four of them had been in their room packing. It had been Sirius's idea, because of course it had. Oi, Remus, wanna throw me the cufflinks on my dresser? Sirius had been sitting on his bed, mountains of clothes piled around him. I think that might be the poshest thing anybody's ever asked me. Remus missed the meaningful look exchanged between James and Sirius. Peter stood nervously by the window. Almost as soon as he touched the cufflinks, he recoiled. Ow! What? He clutched his hand to his chest, face going ashen as he looked at them more closely. Silver. They were silver. James and Sirius thought they were so clever. It made him feel a bit sick to think about it now. How triumphant they had felt. Look at us, they had thought. We figured it out. Something you want to tell us, Remus? Sirius grinned while Remus stared between the three of them in horror. It was... just... static. They... shocked me. Come on, we're not that dim. James was off his bed at that point, leaning against the dresser next to Remus. We're right, aren't we? Gone every full moon, can't touch silver, in, in the scars. They aren't that noticeable. It had come out of him like a reflex, something Remus had no doubt spent his childhood being reassured of. An age-old insecurity he was trying to talk himself out of. Not that James or Sirius picked up on it at the time. The wicked is what they are. For some reason, they hadn't made Remus feel any better. Please, just... Please. And suddenly James has a horrible sense of deja vu, having just heard that exact same plea echoing through the halls of the Shrieking Shack. They had been young, only twelve. They couldn't understand couldn't even begin to comprehend all that Remus had been through, all that he had to be afraid of. It had seemed fun to them, like a superpower, a party trick. But they aren't those kids anymore. They know better now. They've seen enough to know better. So how did this happen? How did they end up here? James. James opens his eyes, not realizing he had closed them in the first place finding Remus wide-eyed and awake. James, fuck. What happened? Snape... Snape was there, he... Hey, hey, it's okay. Everything is okay. Which isn't really true, but he's not sure what else to say. He was there. Remus looks at James like he wants to tell him he's wrong, that he made it up, that none of it happened. And James wishes he could, more than anything. Yeah, yeah, Moons, he was there. Please. Please. He saw. He knows. James silently begs the universe to just give them a little more time before the adults come in with their questions and accusations. He knows. Remus's chest hitches and for a second James thinks he stopped breathing altogether, but then he starts jerkily nodding his head. Okay. Okay. Okay, so... So I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to leave. He isn't looking at James anymore. That's okay, I can take my house at home, by post, and then, and then, I don't know, I'll, I'll get a job, I guess, a, a muggle job, where no one will know me, and, and that's okay, I can do that, I can... Moons. Remus. James yanks on his hand, pulling him back. You're not being expelled. He'll tell everyone, James. Remus uses his free hand to try and wipe away the tears now sneaking from his eyes. And once he does, they won't let Dumbledore keep me here. It's... but that's okay. I never should have been here in the first place, really. This was all a bit of a gift, anyway. Hey, no, stop that. None of that is happening, okay? Remus, Remus, look at me. And he does, with eyes that say he's spent his life cutting away pieces of himself, trying to carve out the person he thinks the world wants. I've talked to Dumbledore. He's going to make sure Snake keeps his mouth shut. You're not going anywhere, okay? Remus seems to swallow with difficulty. Dumbledore said that. He's probably going to come through those curtains any minute and explain it to you himself. James squeezes his hand again, 
You're not going anywhere, okay? I promise. It takes a minute for that to sink in, for Remus to accept it, even a little bit, and James watches as he sits back against his pillows. Snape's okay. Completely fine, I'm sorry to report. Remus doesn't acknowledge the joke. I didn't... I didn't hurt him. I didn't hurt you. Pushed us down the stairs, but other than that, nah, you're a puppy, really. <laughs> Fuck. James. Remus finally pulls his hand free, bringing it up to his face. How did this happen? How did he know? And oh, how James has been dreading this question. For some reason, he can't get Sirius's face out of his head. The way he'd looked in second year when he thought of the cufflinks. And then somehow that smile turns into the one he'd had in the dorm room. All teeth. All pain. That's always been the problem with Sirius Black. He's all light, or all dark, with no in-between. James, you know, don't you? James wants to lie. He desperately wants to lie. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I know. It... Serious. He has to force it out because otherwise he doesn't think he'll ever be able to say it. What? Sirius told him how to get past the tree. Please. Please. Remus just stares at him. Like maybe if he's still enough, the words won't find him. And then he won't have to deal with it. But why? James can see him fighting tooth and nail to keep it together. Why would he do that? Just breathe, Remus, okay? I need you to breathe. But he doesn't think Remus is listening to him. Why would he do that? Please. Please. James shakes his head, feeling helplessly broken. <sighs> I don't know. I'm sorry, Remus. I'm so sorry. And James knows then that he will never be able to hate Sirius Black. Because he doesn't. But oh, how he wants to. James spends the day in the hospital wing with Remus. They don't talk much. Peter brings their schoolwork and breakfast. Stays for a while. Have you seen him? When Peter is leaving, they walk away from Remus's bed talking quietly by the door. Peter nods. He's in the room. He asked about Remus. He wanted to come, but I, I thought it would be a bad idea. James nods. Thanks. See you at dinner? Maybe. James pats him on the shoulder before heading back to Remus, who's been burying himself in a history book for the last hour. Moons? He's leaning against the end of the bed. Remus's eyes flick up briefly before dropping back down. Mm. Everything about his posture has closed off. Since the conversation this morning, he's been nearly silent. James doesn't blame him. Not at all. But he hates it. I just have to do something real quick, but I'll be back soon, okay? <sighs> you don't have to be here, James. His eyes don't lift from the page in front of him. I know, but I want to be. They've already had this conversation several times this morning, and James doesn't think that either of them feels like getting into it again. I'll be back. Remus just nods his head. Before he makes it out of the hospital wing, he casts a look at the bed a few paces away. According to Pomfrey, Snape is awake now. James knows that he's talked to Dumbledore, knows that he told them all that Sirius was the one who told him about the Whomping Willow, which, of course, led to James being interrogated again. He feels a bit wary of leaving Remus alone with him, even knowing Pomfrey is just in her office and that Snape hasn't got his wand back yet. This won't take long, though. And if he wants to do it, he has to go now. So, reluctantly, he pushes through the door and into the corridor. Pomfrey told Remus he was well enough to return to the dorms if he wanted to. He didn't. James wasn't surprised and he doesn't blame him. He doesn't want to go back there either, if he's being honest. But he can't have Remus hiding out in the hospital wing for the rest of the year. Professor. McGonagall looks up from the paperwork on her desk, brows drawing together at the sight of him. Potter. He steps further into the room. Can I talk to you for a minute. She only pauses briefly before gesturing to the seat in front of her. He sits on the edge, not intending to get comfortable. He doesn't want to be here long. She leans forward across her desk, 
fingers weaving together, she waits patiently for him to continue. Is Sirius going to be expelled? He wouldn't fight it if it happened. It would be right after what he's done. But the thoughts still brace his heart. They've always been together, the four of them, ever since they first met. And if he's being honest, James has never thought that would change. Not as they got older, or left Hogwarts. It felt like this unquestionable law of the universe. The Marauders belong together. Always. I'm afraid it is not my place to discuss that with you. James nods. He'd been expecting that, but he figured he'd try anyway. Well, if he isn't, I think he should be moved to a new dorm. He can't really think about it, what he's asking. Because if he does, he won't do it. I see. It is not commonplace to remove students from their dorms. This isn't exactly a common situation, though, is it? McGonagall dips her head in acknowledgement, but doesn't say anything else. <sighs> Look, it isn't fair to Remus. To make him have to face him like that, have to see him every day. He deserves to feel safe. And how will he ever feel safe if he has to share a room with a person who... Betrayed him? Lied to him? Used him? Broke his heart? James isn't sure how to best sum up what Sirius did. McGonagall nods slowly. I'll see what I can do. There are no more available beds. But if I can find someone willing to switch with him, would that be acceptable to you? Yes. The thought makes his stomach clench. Having someone else in their room, in Sirius' bed. Yes, that would be acceptable. Good. James gets out of his chair, anxious to get back to Remus. You're still with Mr. Lupin, in the hospital wing, I imagine? Uh, yeah. McGonagall nods. Best that you stay there. The parents will be arriving soon. James's heart plummets into his stomach. The parents? An hour later, James finds himself in Dumbledore's office with Remus, Sirius, and Snape. It is maybe the most awkward he has ever felt in his entire life. None of them speak. None of them even look at each other. Sirius is sunk low in his chair, eyes on the floor, a sick expression on his face. Snape sitting rimrod straight, face pale, eyes unwavering on the headmaster. James separates them from Mooney, whom he sneaks glances at every few seconds. But Remus's face is unreadable, wiped clean of the pain of this morning. And while he understands why, part of James wants to tell him to drop it. Let them see. Let them see how much fucking damage they've done. As much as he was dreading the arrival of the parents, it's almost a relief when McGonagall opens the door. The tension was starting to make his skin itch. Boys. His mum is the first one through, dressed in muggle clothing. She usually is when she's at home. Blue jeans, white floral blouse. He's sure Snape will be bringing that up at some point. Mum. James doesn't know if he should stand up or not, but his mother doesn't really give him the chance. She's almost instantly in front of them. Remus, love. All right? Euphemia kisses the top of his head. Yes, Mrs. Potter. It's Effie, darling. She kisses his head one more time before moving on to James, the other parents still filing in, somewhat less determinedly than Euphemia Potter. She takes his face in her hands, kissing him as well, of course. On the forehead, the cheek, the top of his mess of hair, Mom. Except that, the truth is, James is so glad she's here. Now they can feel her and see her. Glad that someone else can take control of the situation, because James honestly doesn't know what to do with it. His mother presses her forehead to his. You're okay? James wonders if it's actually some kind of spell, the way it calms him down instantly. Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. Euphemia nods, forehead rubbing against his as she pulls away. James isn't sure if he was expecting more Burger to come or not, but she isn't there. Snape's mother is. A mousy woman with brown hair and nervous eyes. And the Lupins, coming to stand at the sun's side. Hope looking nervous, whispering something in Remus's ear. Lyle looking... tired. James assumes Fleamont is at work. Oh, serious. James turns to see his mother crouched in front of his best friend, trying to meet his eye. It takes James a moment to realise that Sirius is crying and trying desperately to hide it. It's okay, sweetheart. It's okay. We'll sort it out, I promise. Sirius just shakes his head as he quickly wipes his eyes on his sleeve. James is angry and sad at the same time and he isn't at all sure what to do with that. 
Mostly he wishes his mother would stop acting like all Sirius did was break a dish or cheat on a test, instead of put two people's lives at risk. Euphemia stands, moving to go behind their chairs, one hand on Sirius and one on James. You've all been informed of what transpired last night. McGonagall is standing beside Dumbledore. Does the minister know you keep a werewolf at this school? James clenches his teeth. They don't keep him, Eileen. Euphemia answers before Dumbledore can. He's a student. He attends Hogwarts just like everyone else. Leave it, Effie. That almost makes James angrier. Remus looks as though he's trying to cave in on himself. It would seem that Sirius and Severus took a game of chicken a bit too far. I didn't know there was going to be a werewolf in there. James thinks if someone refers to Remus as a werewolf one more time, he's going to lose it. Dumbledore's cool blue eyes fall on the Slytherin. That's true. You did know, however, that both the Willow and the Shack were off limits, correct? Yes. And do forgive me, but while Mr. Black did not tell you exactly what you were walking into, I do believe he made it clear that it wasn't a surprise party, correct? Snape doesn't answer this time, just glares. Therefore, you did make the decision to enter into a dangerous situation even if you were not entirely aware of how dangerous it was in order to prove yourself to Mr. Black? I don't need to prove anything to him. To satisfy your own curiosity. Either way, while Mr. Black certainly enticed you, he did not force you to do anything. Or am I mistaken? That's correct. I am glad we can all agree. There is something slightly off about Dumbledore's cheerfulness. Something dangerous that makes the hair stand up on the back of James's neck. Then you will understand why I have decided to take a hundred points from Slytherin. Snape's mouth literally falls open. And give you detention with Professor McGonagall every weekend for the rest of term. This is ridiculous. That thing attacked my son. Mrs. Snape points a bony finger in Remus's direction. James moves to stand, ready to take this woman apart, but his mother pushes him back down. I'll kindly ask you not to refer to my students as things, Eileen. And I'll ask less kindly. That earns Euphemia a barely repressed smirk from McGonagall. Yes, I think you will find this is still my school, Mrs. Snape. Dumbledore seems unfazed by all of this. If you disagree with my methods, feel free to remove your son from the premises. James sees the sudden fear in Snape's eyes and he grabs hold of his mother's wrist just as she opens her mouth to speak again. Leave it, Mum, please. It's fine. Mrs. Snape looks down, seemingly startled that her son has spoken to her, and then back up at Dumbledore. Fine. But I want it known that I think it is absolutely barbaric. Yes, yes, we've noted you. You're outnumbered, Eileen. Bow out gracefully. James thinks there's a very good chance that Snape's mum is going to combust. Her face somehow manages to grow even more pinched, her high cheeks flushing a bright and unattractive red. Once again, Dumbledore appears unbothered by the squabbling. Excellent. Now, Mr. Black, this whole situation does seem to start with you, doesn't it? Sirius says nothing, head still down, which makes James somehow angrier. He shoots a worried look at Remus, who's sitting with his shoulders rolled in like he's trying to pull as far away from his parents as he can without actually getting out of his chair, eyes very determinedly on his hands. James hopes Dumbledore puts them all out of their misery soon, because this was really the last thing Mooney needed. It has been decided that you will remain at school. I'm not being expelled? No. But you will be removed from the Gryffindor Quidditch team. That hits James surprisingly hard. Maybe because he hadn't really thought that far ahead. Thought of what the day to day was going to look like after this. And you will be serving detentions for the remainder of the term, like Mr. Snape, with Professor McGonagall. I will also be taking a hundred points from Gryffindor. Sirius swallows, nodding along to all of this, face pale. 
and you will be moving doors. What? Sirius looks like he didn't mean to let the word out, and James's eyes shoot to McGonagall, who gives him a slight nod. After the events of last night, it has been deemed inappropriate for you to continue to share a dorm with Mr. Lupin. So, Frank Longbottom has agreed to switch with you. James does his best not to be bitter about the fact that this means Sirius will be getting his own room. The alternative would be Mooney switching with Frank, and, if he's honest, the last thing he wants is for Remus to be isolated. I have to leave my room? <sighs> James receives a pointed squeeze from his mother's hand, but he doesn't care. He feels Sirius's eyes on him, but refuses to feel bad. Mooney could have died. He could have killed Snape. Which, honestly, for Remus, would have been worse. Yes, for the safety of everyone involved. You think I'm insane? Surely that isn't necessary. The hell it isn't. James. James has had just about enough of listening to a bunch of people who have no idea what they're talking about, acting like they have any right to decide what happens here. He put Remus at risk. He could have been hurt. Snape had his wand on him when I got there. James feels something slightly hysterical clawing at his chest, like everything he couldn't feel last night is bubbling to the surface. He's always loved the way his mother takes care of everyone, the way she protects Sirius. But there are things that are unforgivable. Maybe James doesn't hate Sirius, but he sure as hell doesn't like him very much. These are people's lives we're talking about. James looks at Sirius for the first time, and the other boy stares back, eyes wide. They aren't fucking toys. They don't exist for your amusement. James. I mean house points. Detention. This is a fucking joke. What would you suggest, James? Anything. Something. This isn't... This is a crime. You can't just allow them to treat people like this. James. Euphemia tries to calm her son down for the third time. You weren't there. You weren't there. You didn't have to... You weren't there. James closes his eyes for a second, trying to get a hold of all the feelings forcing their way to the surface, trying to rip his skin apart. It must have been very scary for you to find your friend in such a vulnerable position. After several seconds, James forces his eyes to open again. You know what was scary, Professor? Watching my best mate smile while he told me what he'd done. <laughs> McGonagall was right. It is safer for all of us if he's on his own. James's mother squeezes his shoulder but doesn't bother objecting again. There's an eerie silence now, and James almost regrets freaking out on everyone. Except that he can't quite shake the feeling that they deserved it. The Lupins have agreed not to press charges. They've decided not to press charges. It's my son who's been attacked here. As we already discussed... Since your son quite knowingly put himself in danger, you would hardly have a case. <sighs> Given all that has happened, we've told your parents that you are more than welcome to go home for a period of time to rest, recover. James sees Remus stiffen in his chair. No, I... I want to stay. I want to be here, please. Hope worries her bottom lip. Fingers fidgeting with her sleeve. Are you sure, Rem? It might be good he for- He said he didn't want to. Stop fussing over him and leave it be. Dumbledore still focused on Remus. You're sure that's what you want? It is. Very well. Then the last order of business is to collect the memory from James. I, uh, what? The Ministry while agreeing to allow us to handle this internally, needs confirmation that the events occurred as we have described, that Mr. Lupin was, in fact, safely secured. James sees Remus flinch out of the corner of his eye. And that there was no unprovoked attack, and no mauling of you or Mr. Snape, since you are the only witness to the entirety of last night's events. Your memory is needed. Remus, once again, curls in on himself. James grits his teeth. Okay, fine. Whatever. His mother squeezes his shoulder. I'll be right here. The rest of you are free to go. Professor McGonagall will show you out. 
James is looking at Dumbledore, who pulls out a vial and places it on the desk in front of him. Now that the room is empty, there is suddenly space for James's fear, and he feels it creeping up his spine, pricking his heart. Will it hurt? No. James nods, getting to his feet and walking forward. He can feel his mother following behind him as he picks up the glass tube, cold in his hands. Will they be able to hear my thoughts? What I was thinking when it happened? The thought makes a vaguely sick feeling wash over James, a bunch of ministry lackeys listening to him run around terrified. No, they will view the memory as third-party observers. The perspective change is part of what makes the Pensieve so useful. James swallows. Throat dry as he pulls out his wand. He looks up at Dumbledore one last time. Will I forget? Once it's out of me. Dumbledore takes his time now. Eyes running James over. James used to think that those blue eyes were kind. Safe. But these last few hours he's looked at them too many times to believe that anymore. There's something underneath the playfulness. Something cold and calculated. It makes James shiver. Would you like that? Albus! Dumbledore doesn't take it back. His stare doesn't falter. I don't know. No, I guess. I wish it hadn't happened. But since it did, I'd rather know. Dumbledore smiles softly. Ignorance is peace, but knowledge is freedom. James stares back at him blankly. You won't forget. It may fade slightly, feel less vibrant, but it will still be there. Okay. Good. James brings the tip of his wand to his temple. It does hurt. Dumbledore is a dirty liar. And maybe it isn't the spell. Maybe it's just the memory. The night before runs through him at double speed, and he feels every second of it. Every scratch, every crack in his heart, every scream out of Mooney's mouth. It tears itself from him violently and unwillingly, claws digging in as he attempts to pour it into the vial, his hands shaking. I don't want to get past the tree. Please, please stay away. I beg you, please, just leave. A werewolf? The freak is a werewolf? James? He nearly drops it as the last of the night bleeds out of him. His mother instantly steps forward, placing the vial on Dumbledore's desk before wrapping James in her arms. It's okay, my love. You were so brave. She places kisses onto the top of his head. It's not until then that James realises he's been crying. I'm okay. Thank you, James. Very helpful. Dumbledore places a stopper in the top of the vial before sliding it into a small rack on his desk. Oh, well, as long as he could be helpful to you. Dumbledore doesn't respond to her, and James wonders if she speaks to him like this often. If this is what they're like when they close all those doors in his face. I'll give you two some privacy. Dumbledore steps out from behind his desk, indigo robes fluttering behind him. Feel free to take as long as you need. Euphemia is still holding James. He should probably feel embarrassed by that, but he doesn't. He should probably step away, but he doesn't do that either. He hadn't realised how much he needed this until now. I'm okay. James doesn't know who he's trying to comfort. I know, baby. Euphemia gives him another squeeze before pulling back enough to hold his face, thumbs wiping away the tears he doesn't remember shedding. I love you, you know that? James nods. Yeah, I know. I love you too. Good. She pulls him forward kissing the top of his head before letting go. They stand still for a minute, James wiping his nose on his sleeve. I don't know if I can forgive him for this. His mother nods sadly. I know you don't. And I don't know how you can brush it off. I'm not brushing it off. It was horrible what he did, James. I know that. 
but I also know a broken person when I see them. I can't imagine me shouting at him would have done much. James isn't sure he agrees. Where's Walburga? His mother looks surprised. Walburga? Why would she be here? She's his mother. The words taste bitter in his mouth. Euphemia watches him for a moment before nodding slowly. She is? But she's not his guardian. Not since last summer. It isn't surprising. James doesn't know why it hadn't occurred to him before. Oh, you and Dad? Yes. Did... How did you do that? His mother leans back against Dumbledore's desk. <sighs> we asked for custody, and while Berger and Orion gave it to us. Another fact that shouldn't surprise him as much as it does. They just... gave him away. Just like that. She grimaces. I'd appreciate it if you didn't put it to Sirius like that. But yes, more or less. I'm not talking to Sirius. It's the only thing he can think to say. His stomach squeezing at the idea that anyone could treat their child so casually. Like they were disposable. Right. Well, when you start to again... You're so certain I will. Euphemia smiles softly at him. Yes, I am. James only scowls. I've watched you two since you were eleven years old, James. You fit together so well, so beautifully. Oh, and when you came back after first year... She smiles more fully now. The looks on your little faces when you had to say goodbye. You cried the whole way home, do you remember? I was a kid. I cried over loads of dumb stuff. Euphemia shakes her head. Not like this. As soon as we got home, the first thing you did was write to him. Wrote to him every day that summer. James runs a hand through his hair, not appreciating this particular walk down memory lane. We aren't those people anymore. Maybe. But it wouldn't hurt this bad if you didn't love him. His mother, he firmly believes, is an expert in legitimacy. The way she cuts right through everything, striking at your core. Sometimes I feel like I'm lying to everyone. Lying about what? James almost laughs. Everything. People look at me like I'm supposed to know what I'm doing and I have no idea. I want to do, you know, the right thing. Mostly. Most of the time. And I used to be so sure I knew what that was, but now... If you had asked him a day ago if there was anyone on the planet he trusted more than Sirius Black, he would have answered without hesitating. No. No one. He's the best person I know. The bravest. The strongest. No. If you had asked him a day ago if Sirius would ever use Remus as a prop, to get back at Snape or because of some petty bullshit some guy said to him in a fight. He would have had an answer for you too. No question. And he would have been wrong. Mostly, I feel like I'm just treading water. Like I'm barely keeping my head above the tide. And I keep waiting to grow up. Everyone wants me to. To be better. I want that too, I do. So I just... I wait. Wait for the day that I don't feel like everything is too big. Because somehow life got so big and I still feel so fucking small. Oh, honey. His mother reaches out, brushing a hand through his hair. The truth is, no one knows what they're doing. We're all just trying our best. I'm afraid that feeling never really goes away. <laughs> well, that's depressing. Yeah, a bit. But it also means you can cut yourself some slack. You're only 15, James, and you're doing wonderfully considering the circumstances. Pretty sure you have to say that, as my mum. Euphemia smiles, pulling him into a hug. I don't, actually. If you were being a little shit, I'd let you know, believe me. James squeezes <laughs> her back, trying to soak up as much comfort as he can. Thank you for coming. He doesn't know why he says it. Like she wasn't summoned. Like she had a choice. Still, he means it. I'll always come for you, James. Her chin is resting on top of his head. I promise. When he walks into his dorm room, everything is just as it was when he left. It's not surprising. Nothing happened here. There's no reason for it to be any different. And yet it feels insulting, almost. That it should be so untouched when everything else is unravelling. There are no lights on, the blue of the summer evening the only thing lighting the space, and so it takes him a minute to realise that, actually, everything is not exactly the same. Sirius's clothes have gone from the floor, the trunk missing from the end of his bed. 
the records his uncle gave him gone. James stands, frozen, staring at the empty halls now suddenly so painfully obvious to him, and feels a wave of mourning crash against his ribs. You're back. He looks behind him and finds Rima standing in front of the washroom, door closing behind him. James nods. Pete? Great Hall. Shit, is it dinner already? Remus nods, walking slowly forward to stand next to James, both of them at the foot of Sirius's bed, like a black hole in the centre of the room, drawing them in. All James can think is, it was never supposed to be this way, which just drags all his anger back to the surface. Because fuck Sirius. Fuck him for doing this to them. <sighs> Remus shoves his hands into his pockets. James looks over at him, but Remus keeps his eyes on the bed, even when he starts speaking. He kissed me. Those words are big. They have weight. They take up space. He watches Remus for a few more seconds before moving to sit on the end of the bed, facing him. Listening. He was upset. You'd been hit by the bludger. You were still in the hospital wing, and he was upset, and I was trying to comfort him, and he kissed me. Remus screws up his face, pulling his mouth to the side, and James can tell he's trying not to cry. And... I... kissed him... back. I took advantage of him. Remus... His friend shakes his head. I should have stopped it. I should have pushed him away, but I just... I've wanted him. I've wanted him for so long. James wonders how it is that he never noticed it. Not until this year. Not until everything started to fall apart. How could he have been so clueless? So self-involved that he couldn't see what was growing between two of the most important people in his life. He didn't... react well. We stopped talking for a bit. I noticed. Remus nods. Still talking more to the bed than to James. But then things... recently, they've been... better. He's been so... I don't know, affectionate? James nods. Yeah, I noticed that too. <laughs> Good. I'm glad someone else did. Remus closes his eyes briefly. Worried it was all in my head. It wasn't. Remus nods slowly, a grimace shooting across his face, like he's in pain. Do you think... His eyes are still closed. Do you think... that's why he did it? It takes a minute for the full meaning of Remus's words to hit him, and when they do, they're punched to his gut. No. No, Remus, no way. You didn't see his face. After we kissed, you didn't see... <sighs> Remus opens his eyes, wet and shining in the dim light. No one's ever looked at me like that before. <laughs> and I'm a werewolf. Every word pulls and yanks and drags James down low. Well, maybe that was it. James can see the tears making their way down Remus's face. Maybe he wasn't upset that he kissed a boy. Maybe he was upset that he kissed a fucking wolf. Stop. Remus, stop. None of that is true. He doesn't think like that. James says that, but he can so clearly see Sirius lying on this bed, smiling. We have a fucking werewolf. You sure about that? Remus looks at him properly for the first time, and it aches. Yes. Because two days ago I told him I was seeing a boy and he hugged me and said I was his brother. Because I saw the pain in his eyes when you walked away from him at Christmas. Because I saw the way he looked at you yesterday when he thought no one else could see. James leaves too much unsaid. He knows it. But for some reason, none of those words can make it out of him. Remus opens his mouth at the same time that there's rustling at the door. He quickly brings his hands to his face, scrubbing the tears away before he turns back to the bathroom. I'm going to take a shower. Remus. It's too late. He's already disappeared into the other room. <sighs> James runs a hand over his face turning around, expecting to see Peter and instead finding Frank, dragging his trunk with one hand and holding a box of stuff in the other. Oh. James stares at the older boy. 
Hello to you too. James quickly jumps out of his way as he struggles over, dumping his box of stuff into Sirius's bed. Frank's hands are on his hips as he looks around. A bit dark in here, isn't it? James smiles grimly, moving to sit on his own bed. Yeah, a bit. Frank flicks his wand, lighting the lamps, eyes trailing over the bed surrounding him. Oh, privacy was nice while it lasted. He shoots James a look as he bends over and starts rifling through his stuff. Heads up, Alice will be coming here from time to time. <laughs> this conversation feels so out of place after the one he was just having. Just close your curtains, yeah? And use a silencing charm or something. <laughs> Obviously, we're not barbarians. James barely manages a smile, sitting there watching Frank unpack, putting his pictures on Sirius's nightstand, his clothes in Sirius's drawers. Some childish part of himself wants to throw a fit. No, don't touch that, he shouts. It's not yours. Hey, thanks for doing this. James rubs awkwardly at the back of his neck. Frank sends him a sidelong look as he places his jumpers neatly in a drawer. Remus will at least get the orderly roommate he's always wanted. I said no at first. Oh yeah? Frank nods. I told McGonagall it was a lost cause, so that you'd tear the school apart before you let someone take black from you. James tries to swallow, but his throat has grown too tight. What changed your mind? Frank pauses in his unpacking, eyes meeting James's. She told me it was your idea. That's how I knew. No. Frank nods. That whatever happens, it, it was serious. They're still for a moment, and James waits for the questions that ought to follow that. The, what happened? What could be so bad? What did he do? But they don't come. Eventually, Frank goes back to his unpacking. I, I figured if something that bad happened, that was probably more important than me having my own room. James has always looked up to Frank. As an only child, he had no older siblings to emulate, to chase after. There was his dad, but that was different. Plus, Fleamont had a tendency to go places James couldn't follow. Then he came to Hogwarts and he met Frank. When they were first years and he was a third year. Which at the time felt like a big deal. Felt old. He was one of the youngest members on the Gryffindor Quidditch team and even then he had been bloody brilliant. James remembers watching him and thinking, Me. That's going to be me. I'm going to be just like that. On top of that, Frank was just... Nice. He was always there. If you got lost or forgot the password, he never seemed frustrated or exasperated like some of the other older kids. Even before he became prefect or head boy, he would go out of his way to help people. He never made a show of it. Frank didn't want attention. Never seemed to know what to do with it once he got it. Thanks. Frank looks up from the trousers he'd been folding. Of course. If you... You need to talk, James. You let me know, yeah? James nods, stomach tightening because he knows that he can't. Couldn't. Even if he wanted to. Sure. <coughs> sure, yeah, I will. When he walks into the come-and-go room, Regulus is sitting on one of the sofas. It hasn't been that long since they last saw one another, but it feels like ages, and James's heart does something weird in his chest as he stops by the door, grey eyes holding him still. Listen. Regulus stands up but doesn't come closer. A full room between them. I know you're angry about what happened yesterday. James almost laughs, because of course Regulus has no idea what happened yesterday. I know I went too far. I do. For the first time in hours, James feels his body relax. Because he's here, with Reg. Here in their space. Because Regulus's voice is steady and familiar and he's been craving it all day desperate to find something to ease the anxiety growing in his stomach. And here it is. Because of course it is. Of course it's him. And Evan and Barty. James blinks, realising that Regulus has been speaking this whole time. His face is scrunched, serious. They were out of line. Way out of line. They're assholes, honestly. But their parents are friends with my mum, and so I can't really... It's complicated. It isn't that he's not mad. About all of it. About everything that happened in that hallway. It's just that he can't feel it right now. Doesn't have the space for any more anger or betrayal. Maybe it's because he hasn't slept at all, or because everything in his life seems to be falling apart. But all he feels when he looks at Regulus is warmth and home, and it's so nice. 
After everything that's happened, he just wants to hold on to that. James? Regulus brings James's drifting mind back to the present. He really does need to get some sleep. I am sorry. I didn't... I mean, he followed me into the corridor, and I swear I tried to walk away, but he wasn't having it. He just kept... I love you. Regulus's mouth abruptly slams shut, eyes growing wide, the room suddenly very quiet. There's a long moment of stillness, in which neither of them seems quite able to deal with what James has just thrown into the middle of the room. But eventually, the older boy breaks. I don't want to fight with you. I'm tired. And I'm... I'm having a really, really shitty day, and I just... I need you. I just need you. Is that... Is that okay? Regulus is staring at him, stalk still, grey eyes blinking. Say it again. <laughs> which part? You know which part. James doesn't know why he suddenly feels nervous when he's already said it. I love you, Regulus. It surprises him when Regulus moves, closing the space between them in record time. Suddenly his mouth is on James's and he can't hold back the noise that it pulls from him. Needy is the only word that comes to mind. Regulus has his hand on the back of James's neck, bringing him to his level, mouth opening him up, warm and sweet and safe. When James regains control of his body, he wraps his arms around Regulus, pulling him closer until there's no space between their bodies and still, somehow, it isn't close enough. His hands move down, down Regulus's back, his sides, slipping under his thighs and lifting him up. Regulus's legs wrapping automatically around his waist. Stupid jock. <laughs> it feels good. It all feels so fucking good and he's starving for it. For something that doesn't ache. That doesn't feel like treading water. When Regulus's hands are on him, he can breathe. He stumbles towards the bed, spilling Regulus onto his back and holding himself above. The other boy blinks up at him, eyes bright and reaching into him pulling on his chest, squeezing the air out of his lungs. It isn't noon, feeling overwhelmed by this, by him. But James is raw tonight, and all of a sudden looking at Regulus under him is too much. Because he wants him. He wants him here, like this, always. Except didn't last night prove that he can't have that? That you can't keep people. They're too hard to hold. That everyone slips through your fingers eventually, no matter how much you love them. James? Regulus reaches up to press his hand to James's face. Sorry. Sorry, I'm a bit of a mess right now. James drops his head, forehead resting against Regulus's. Good to know you're human. James goes to laugh, but it gets trapped in his throat. You want to tell me what happened? Yes, but I can't. Regulus's thumb brushes against his cheek before his hand slowly trails down to James's chest, gently pushing him down onto the bed. They lie facing one another. I'm sorry. Regulus just shakes his head. You don't have to apologize to me. Regulus leans forward, pressing a quick kiss to James's mouth. Sweet. Innocent. It makes something in James sing. They just lie there for a minute. James trying to work out what the hell is going on with him and Regulus just waiting. Eventually, the younger boy reaches out, running his hand through James's hair, and James closes his eyes, leaning into the touch. Serious hurt someone. James has to tell someone. Someone who isn't directly involved because it's eating him up inside. Regulus's hand stills. Did he hurt you? Yes, James almost says, because it feels true. He opens his eyes to look at the boy across from him. Would it matter? Yes. I'd kill him. The thing is, James thinks he might be serious. Don't think that'd help, but I appreciate the offer. Regulus's eyes narrow. James. No. No, not me. But someone... important. James sees Remus's face, standing in their darkened room, the pain in his eyes. James rolls onto his back and brings his hands up to his face. I don't know what to do. He... It was bad, Reg. It was so fucking bad. 
Do you know why he did it? <laughs> Merlin, I don't know. He was upset, but all he said to me is that he wasn't thinking. Even saying that out loud makes the anger boil in his blood again. He wasn't thinking. All of a sudden, Regulus is sitting up. Reg? James is a little startled, propping himself on his elbows. Regulus's legs are crossed, his expression distant. Hey. James reaches out, tugging lightly on his shirt. Sorry, do you not want to talk about... I realise he's your brother and things are... Regulus shakes his head. No, it's fine. Listen, I don't know what happened. He runs a hand nervously through his short curls. But he might not mean what you think he does when he says he wasn't thinking. James's brows draw together. I'm going to need you to explain that. Regulus nods, clearly expecting it. You remember how I said that sometimes I have to lock parts of me up? But I can't feel everything. His eyes are focused on some distant point on the bed. Yeah, I remember. Sirius was the one who taught me that trick. James feels his eyebrows raise. Trick? We were, I don't know, seven and eight. Maybe he was nine. I can't remember. I was bawling my eyes out because our mother had gone on one of her rampages. And he was just... fine. Regulus shakes his head, an almost rueful look on his face. He was always fine. Even though he got the brunt of it. Put himself in her line of fire every time. He never cried. I was so jealous of that when I was a kid. Regulus pauses. James is watching him pick at the blanket in front of him. Trying not to think about Sirius and Dumbledore's office today. Trying to hold back tears. So he told me. Told me that he just took all the things that he didn't want to feel or think. That he didn't want our mother to see. To see? Yeah. Well, Berger is very good at legitimacy. It's hard to hide things in that house. James can feel the horror on his face. Oh, Christ! Regulus flashes him a grim smile before he goes back to staring at the bed. Yeah. Anyway... You can kind of hide things inside yourself. We used to practice. We got good at it. I don't know if it's proper occlumency or not, but it works. The thing is, when you hide things from yourself, feelings, thoughts, it makes the rest of the world feel kind of far away and I don't know. Pointless. Regulus looks up again and holds James's gaze this time. You can do things you wouldn't normally. And James has no idea what to do with any of that. The idea of Sirius and Regulus hiding out in Grimmauld Place, teaching themselves how not to feel is heartbreaking. And he wonders, not for the first time, how either of them survived it. I'm not saying that to excuse whatever it is that he did. But when he says he wasn't thinking, it's just... It means more coming from him, that's all. Regulus smiles weakly. He's the best of us, really. Even when he was a kid, always stood up to her. And they made him pay for it. He chews on his bottom lip. They're still making him pay for it. James feels his eyes go wide. Are you... Do you think Sirius is right? About your uncle? That they had him killed for reaching out to him? Regulus shrugs. I don't know. But I wouldn't be surprised. You don't just get to walk away from the House of Black. That's not how it works. It's all too much. How do people handle these things? What are you supposed to do? Because James has no fucking idea. He pulls himself up to sit properly, bending his knees on the mattress and hanging his head for a minute. He doesn't want to talk about Sirius anymore. He can't. It's too confusing. It hurts too much. Do you still have to do it? Do what? James looks up, Regulus's eyes on him. Every time, he thinks. Every bloody time he finds that stare, his insides catch on fire. Hide things from yourself. Regulus looks at him for a long time. Yeah. Had to hide you. Me? Regulus nods and then looks away. James can see him chewing on the inside of his cheek. It's part of the reason I was such a wreck when I came back. You 
<laughs> you take up so much space in me that when I had to feel it again, it was too much. So much more than it had ever been before. I couldn't bear it. Well, you saw. James watches him, eyes running over the ends of his hair, the tip of his nose, the way his lips quirk. He tries to breathe through everything going on inside him, tries to hold it all. James reaches out, makes sure Regulus can see, makes sure he goes slow enough that he can pull away. Come here. James links their fingers together and gives Regulus a light tug. He comes, the pair of them falling back onto the bed, Regulus in James's arms, face burrowing in his neck. Je t'aime. Regulus kisses behind his ear. Je t'aime, je t'aime, je t'aime. Every word is punctuated with a kiss, quick and sweet, under his jaw, along his neck. Regulus's breath is warm against his skin. James's eyes flutter closed. English, just once. Say it in English once. Regulus stills but doesn't pull away. Lips still brushing against James in an accidental way that sends shivers down his spine. Eventually, Regulus props himself up on his elbows, looking at James like he's the only thing in the world. And James can barely stand it. Regulus leans down and brings their mouths together, slow and purposeful, ripping a gasp out of James when he pulls away. I love you. Regulus stares determinedly. I'm sorry. James doesn't understand that. Doesn't know how to make sense of it over the blood rushing in his ears, the heart beating in his chest. Don't apologize. James lifts himself up to Regulus's mouth. Don't ever apologize for loving me. Okay. Lily drops abruptly into the seat across from him, making Remus jump. The books that had been in her hands fan out in front of her. What is going on? Remus looks at her for a moment before returning his attention to the book in front of him. He's finished all his homework. Now he's just revising for his OWLs. Again. Hello to you too. Remus doesn't lift his eyes. Remus. Lily. Remus doesn't lift his eyes. Sirius is off the Quidditch team. Frank is living in your dorm. And the four of you are avoiding one another like the bloody plague. We are not. Remus feels particularly defensive about that last point. Because, the truth is, he has been avoiding James and Peter. But he hates that he's doing it. And hates it even more that people have noticed. Especially Lily. You are. I tried to ignore it, but I can't bear it anymore. What happened? Remus bites down on his lower lip, staring intently at the words that he's no longer reading. Honestly, Lily's so pushy she could give Sirius a run for his money. Remus! Lily yanks the book right out from under him. Oi! He tries to snatch it back, but he's too Shh. slow. I was reading that! And I swear, if you get me banned from the library, I will never forgive you. Lily does not look particularly concerned by either of these statements. She promptly folds down the corner of Remus's page like an animal before closing the book on the table and resting her hands on top of it. Remus! You've been sulking for weeks. I have not been sulking. Remus crosses his arms over his chest and then, realizing how little that helps, quickly uncrosses them. Lily arches a disbelieving eyebrow. You have! You all have. Remus wishes she would stop bringing James and Peter into this. He feels bad enough about them already. He doesn't need her reminding him what a shit friend he's been. Or how it's all his fault that any of this happened in the first place. Yes. Obviously, Sirius is the biggest arsehole on the planet. But if Remus just hadn't been... If he had just been someone else, then none of it would have happened. James puts on a brave face, but Remus can see how much it kills him not talking to Sirius. Part of him wants to tell James it's okay, that he can forgive him if he wants, but the truth is... Remus is too selfish. Because if there's a choice between Remus and Sirius, Remus knows who James will pick, and he just can't bear the thought of losing James. At least not yet. Hey. Lily reaches forward, tapping the back of his hand lightly. Where'd you go? Remus shakes his head, trying to get his thoughts straight. Sorry. 
Lily looks genuinely concerned now. It's bad, huh? Remus almost laughs, running a hand over his face. Yeah. Yeah, it's bad. Lily's eyes are bright and green and very intent on looking directly at him. Remus does his best not to squirm, but he's not sure he manages it. He's never gotten comfortable with being looked at. His parents spent so much of his life looking at the floor, or the ceiling, or some spot over his shoulder. But coming to Hogwarts and having people stare right at him has never felt natural. Come on. Lily scoops up their books in her arms and gets to her feet. Remus blinks. Um, what are you doing? We're going for a walk. Lily nods her head over her shoulder towards the door. Come on, let's go. Remus considers fighting her, but something in her eyes tells him it would be a lost cause. So reluctantly, he gets to his feet, grabbing his bag off the back of his chair. I hope you know that I'm only letting you boss me around because I like you. Lily beams in a way that's so reminiscent of Sirius it makes his heart hurt. And that, right there, is why we're friends. She hands him back his book and they start making their way to the exit. Because I like you? Because you liking me leads to you doing what I say. <laughs> oh. Right. Of course. Also because you know that I'm the only one who actually takes notes in Bin's class. Remus! Oh, I would never use you for your history of magic notes. Besides, it's a fair trade, since I'm loads better at potions than you are. Too good. Now I have to deal with Slughorn coming after me about his bloody dinner parties and Sirius and James coming after me for actually considering going. Merlin, those two are a nightmare, aren't they? Lily steers them towards the courtyard. Remus shrugs non-committally, ignoring the tightening in his chest. He can feel Lily giving him a look out of the corner of his eye. You should come, you know. Remus arches his brow. To the slug club. No, I don't think so. Not for me, really. Not for you, or not for James and Sirius? Remus stops abruptly. So abruptly, in fact, that Lily is a few steps ahead before she realises, turning back to him with a questioning look. If this is going to be a James Potter bashing fest, I'm really not interested, okay? Lily's eyes go wide. No, I... Sorry. She tucks her hair behind her ear. Sorry. Old habits die hard. I just meant... They seem like the type of thing you might like if you let yourself. Remus looks at her skeptically but starts walking again, a pair of them pushing through the doors to the outside. The summer evening warm and sweet, the sky pink as the sun dips below the horizon. I went to one. If you remember. Lily nods, clearly trying to hide a smile. I do. I remember you talking to absolutely no one and then leaving early. Well, everyone there was a social climbing prat. Remus shoots her a quick look. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> None taken. They pull up to one of the benches and Lily collapses, dropping her book bag. <sighs> well, if you're not going to make new friends, you're going to have to stop avoiding the ones you already have. Remus's mouth forms a flat line. I'm not avoiding them. Lily sends him a sceptical look. Yesterday I watched you make a U-turn in the middle of the hallway when you saw Sirius walking towards you. Remus had hoped he'd managed to be a bit more subtle about that. Well, okay. He picks at some lint on his pants. Him I'm avoiding. Sirius? Why? Why? There are so many reasons, really. Or maybe just one. He's never sure with Sirius. Never sure of where they stand, or how he feels, or what he wants. He's memorized all the moments they've touched. He has a list in his head that he pulls up on bad days. Halloween, second year, when Sirius threw his arm around Remus's shoulders. Or Remus's birthday and fourth, when Sirius got tipsy for the first time and kissed his cheek. Or a few weeks ago, the last time, when he laid in bed and Sirius caressed his cheek. Maybe those are the reasons he's avoiding Sirius. Because if they didn't exist, maybe it wouldn't hurt so much that Sirius had told us to If he didn't have lists of Sirius Black in his head, maybe he could just brush it off. So what if he only saw Remus as a pet? He'd been worse things. Hello? Lily waves her hand in front of his face, snapping him back to the present. You still with me? Yeah. Sorry. My mind kind of... Remus doesn't know how to finish that sentence. Was it... Did he do something to you, specifically? I guess that makes sense. It would have to be something like that to get Potter to stop talking to him. Remus pinches the bridge of his nose. <sighs> Potter, Lily, really? Are we back to that? 
You said you didn't want this to be a James Potter bashing fest. I don't. Then I suggest we change the subject. Remus rolls his eyes. You can't avoid him forever. First of all, yes, I absolutely can. And second, pot. Kettle. I am not avoiding James. Oh my god, Remus. We're talking in circles. You are. You know it, and I know it. So let's get over the denial bit, shall we? Remus scowls. Well, I have a valid reason. Brilliant. So do I. Not hardly. Um, excuse me. Lily waves her hand in the direction of the lawn. Remus rolls his eyes. That wasn't an exile-worthy offence. I don't think the silent treatment can reasonably be considered exile. But Remus doesn't take it back, crossing his arms over his chest and sending her a pointed look. Lily holds his gaze for a second or two before throwing her arms up in exasperation. <sighs> I don't know what you want me to say. I thought he'd grown out of being a Burke. Clearly he hasn't. And honestly, I don't have the energy to deal with it. You don't think you could cut him a little slack here? They were extenuating circumstances. They were extenuating circumstances for everyone. You didn't see the rest of us trying to undress someone in front of the whole school. Or shouting out slurs. That causes a dark look to pass over Lily's face. Yeah, well, I'm not speaking to him either. Silence falls around them. And when Remus can't hold Lily stare any longer, he turns to the sky, eyeing it wearily. A month really isn't a very long time, and the full moon is coming up again. The first full moon was sleeping, though. Well, the serious won't be there. I'm just saying, it would be a shame if you two went back to how you were. Remus looks over at Lily. You were good together. Remus rolls his eyes. <sighs> That's not what I meant. You're both just so bright. You know, watching you go head to head when you're having fun is brilliant. Fun? <sighs> Lily raises her brow. Oh, fine. Pretend like you don't know what I mean. But I know you do. She shakes her head, slipping down in her seat and resting her head on the back of the bench. I like him more than I thought I would. Remus thinks he feels himself genuinely smile for the first time in a while. Oh, yeah? Lily turns her head, a sharp look in her eyes. But don't you dare tell him I said that. I'm still mad at him. Besides, his head doesn't need to get any bigger. It's really not that big. It's just his hair. <laughs> that was a terrible joke. Remus shrugs. Sorry, best I got. But I won't tell him. He leans in a little closer. I'm avoiding him, remember? Ah. Uh, Lily nods. But not for the same reason you're avoiding Sirius. No. Or... Oh. Yes. I don't know. Remus sits back, running a frustrated hand through his hair. It's complicated. He can feel Lily eyeing him and can't decide if she's waiting for more information or if she just can't find anything better to look at. He looks over when he hears Lily start rummaging through her bag. I swear I threw them in there. Where are they? I just... I just had them. Come on, you. Oh, aha! She pulls herself back up, a small silver box in her hand. She slides the lid open to reveal a neat row of cigarettes. Remus arches his brow as she places one between her lips before offering him the box. Lily Evans, I never... Remus takes one for himself. Is this really respectable behaviour for a Gryffindor prefect? You tell me. She gestures him forward until the ends of their cigarettes are almost touching. He expects her to pull out a lighter, but instead she brings her fingers up and snaps. <laughs> they both light, and she pulls back to inhale. Never done two at the same time before. Remus is still feeling rather stunned by the whole thing. You ever shown James that trick? The smoke is dry and scratchy in his lungs. It's not that he's never smoked before, only that he hasn't done much of it. The last time he tried, he practically coughed up the entire contents of his chest. I have not. Remus nods. Probably a good idea to keep it that way. I think he'd combust. Cool, isn't it? <laughs> Mary taught me last summer. Ah, Mary, of course. I should have guessed. The cigarette doesn't feel natural between his fingers. Not the way it looks between Lily's. He feels like a kid playing at being a grown-up. A few moments pass. Lily blowing elegant grey clouds into the sky. Remus <coughs> trying to stop himself from choking. <laughs> My dad used to smoke. The smell, I don't know, makes me feel better, calm, thought it might help. Remus doesn't know much about Lily's dad, apart from the fact that he died when she was in second year. 
He remembers that morning, the pale look on her face, the way she had walked away from the table and not come back to class all day. Were you close? Lily smiles a little, looking up at the sky. Sure. I mean, I wasn't telling him my deepest, darkest secrets or anything, but... She closes her eyes for a minute. He used to make me laugh. The smoke blows between her lips. He'd do anything for a good joke. And he used to build things. Turned our garage into a workshop. Made wooden swords and little thrones for me and my sister. I loved that place. Now it just has a car in it. Remus watches her for a minute. The evening grown dimmer. I'm sorry. Lily looks over at him. I'm sorry. About serious. Not sure it's quite the same as her dad dying. Remus offers her a weak smile, but she doesn't return it. Doesn't mean it isn't still painful. You reckon you'll be able to get past it? Remus grimaces, looking down at the cigarette in his hand and flicking the ash off just for something to do. I don't know. Not sure I know how. <coughs> <coughs> he leans forward as his eyes water. Whoa! Breathe, love. <laughs> Lily pats him on the back. <coughs> Sorry. Not much of a smoker. I can see that. She smiles. I'm surprised. I would have thought James and Sirius would be all over it. Fits so nicely with the bad boy images. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, do wizards even smoke cigarettes? I've seen some old ones with pipes, but I've never walked into a shop in Tygon and seen a pack of fags for sale. Lily arches her brow. I mean, you'd know better than me. What? He wipes the last of the tears from his eyes. Why? Lily sends him a bemused look before pointing at herself. Muggle bomb. He blinks a few times. Oh. Oh. Well. I'm not much better. When her bras draw together, he explains. Grew up in the country, not really around anyone else. My dad. He's the wizard of the family. He's always been. pretty. Busy with work. With avoiding his werewolf son. But Remus figures that level of candor is unnecessary. So it was my mum who was around mostly, and her mum, my granny, a few cousins would come visit from time to time. All muggle. He shrugs. <laughs> Barely saw magic before I came to Hogwarts. Huh. Lily rolls the cigarette between her fingers. I always figured if you were magic, you'd use it all the time. I think some people probably do. I will. She shoots him a grin. God, the minute I'm allowed, I'll use magic for everything. <laughs> everything. Lily nods. Everything. Cooking? Ha! Magic. Need something from the next room? Please. I'll Accio all day. Never move. I'll never flick another light switch. Never pick up another dustpan. I'll operate everywhere I go. Who needs to walk? Well, it's good to know you'll be putting your powers to good use. She only grins wider. It'll be brilliant. I can't wait to have a house full of magic. Plants and potions and moving portraits. Remus nods, though he does his best not to think about the future. He's not sure what it holds for him, but he can't imagine it's anything good. Not a lot of opportunities out there for werewolves, and it won't take long for any wizard with half a brain to sniff him out. Hey. Remus looks over as Lily pulls lightly on his shirt. It's going to be okay, you know? She can't possibly have any idea what he's thinking. He wonders what it is that she sees on his face. Yeah. Remus drops the cigarette from his hand and crushes it under his heel. Sure, Lils. You can always feel serious. He takes up space in every room he enters, drawing you to him without even saying a word. He's magnetic. And Remus has always been powerless against it. So really, it's impressive when he stops at the end of the hall, feet away from the portrait to the Gryffindor common room. Impressive that he doesn't go rushing right to the lithe figure leaning against the wall. It's been weeks since he's been properly near Sirius and he can feel the pull in his chest, the hunger in his stomach. Sirius's eyes meet his. Moons. I don't think we're on nickname terms right now. Sirius nods, turning to face Remus properly but not attempting to close the gap between them. For a moment they just stand there, staring at one another. I've been waiting for you. Sirius looks hopelessly awkward. Okay. I- listen, can we talk? We are talking. <sighs> I- 
I've given you time, okay? How generous of you. Remus feels his anger slowly overshadowing everything else going on inside of him. Which is good. Anger is the easiest thing to feel. I... I just mean... I, I just mean... I, I want you to talk to me. Please. Just let me... Give me this chance. No. Remus's brain answers automatically. No, we can't talk. No, you don't get chances. Not after everything you've done, you selfish, manipulative, lying piece of... Talk then. What? You want to talk? Go for it. I'm waiting. I, uh, well, maybe we should go... I don't know. Somewhere a little more... Sirius looks around. A pair of first ears walking up behind him towards the portrait. Private? Where? Sirius's hand rubs the back of his neck nervously. Frank's. I mean, my room. We could... <laughs> I am not going back to your room with you. You don't have to make it sound so... So... Sinister. Everything with you sounds sinister now. Sirius stiffens for a minute, staring back at him with those ridiculous eyes and that ridiculous mouth. Remus has never hated someone so much. Never missed someone so much. Never wanted to sink his teeth in so deep. Fine. Sirius walks past Remus. Come on. Where are you going? And it's habit that has Remus following after him even before he gets an answer, like a fucking dog. He grits his teeth but doesn't turn back. You don't want to come back to my room? Fine. They turn the next corner, walking unnecessarily fast. He stops at an unassuming door, swinging it open and gesturing for Remus to enter. It takes him a minute to realize what he's looking at. Oh, you would know where all the broom cupboards are. Remus walks inside. Not all. Just the ones close to the common room. Remus isn't sure if Sirius means for that to sting, but it does. His heart giving an inconvenient tug. And then... And then... And then... Nothing. They just stand there. Sirius suddenly looking much less confident. Well? Say something or stop wasting my fucking time. Sirius flinches. Right. Right. Remus. And Remus hates it. Hates the way he says his name. Like it hurts. Like it matters. Hates that it makes him want to cry. <laughs> is that all you got? The truth is, from Sirius it's almost enough. So much of Remus just wants to forgive him. Just wants to have him back. No, no, I, I listen, I, I didn't want to hurt you. I've never wanted to hurt you. Sirius's hands are held out pleadingly in front of him, like forgiveness is something Remus can just give to him. Here you go. Make sure to keep that somewhere safe now. I know that I did. I know, and I hate that. You have no idea. But I... I meant what I said at Christmas. You're important to me. Remus feels like each one of his bones is cracking apart. Just not as much as you cared about getting back at Snape, though, right? Or Rosia? Or was it Regulus you were trying to hurt? <laughs> it's not really clear to me. He can see Sirius shrinking back from his words, taking each one like a blow to the face. What is clear is that you didn't think about me at all. Not for a single second. That whoever else was involved in this, I never entered the equation. Not for you. These words have been building in Remus for weeks and he wants them out. He is tired of having them rot inside him. Remus, I... Did you forget that there was a person inside that wolf? Or is that all you see when you look at me? Some fucking... fucking circus act or something? An animal taught to walk on its hind legs? You can't think that. You can't, Remus. What else am I supposed to think? Remus is fighting the sob he can already feel building in his chest. <sighs> You're worse than Snape, you know that? At least I know where I stand with him. At least I know what he thinks of me. You... You had the fucking audacity to make me believe... To make me believe that maybe... He's unwilling to let that last pathetic truth go. He can't stand it anymore. Looking at Sirius, feeling him, smelling him. He turns around, pressing his palms flat against the cold wall behind him and trying to breathe. The silence comes back, wraps itself around them, carving holes in their armor. There never used to be silences between them. Not before this year. Not before the kiss. 
He used to be able to talk to Sirius for hours. Remus quickly closes his eyes against the burn. I know that I fucked up. I have no idea how to make it right. I... You don't have to forgive me. I don't deserve it. I understand that. Really, I do. I just want you to know. No, I just need you to understand that you are so beautiful. Every inch of you, every part of you, you're the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. And I am so, so fucking sorry if I made you feel for even a second like you are. Hates this. Hates that he isn't stronger than this. Hates Sirius for existing. For being all that he is. For burrowing so deeply into Remus's bones. For breaking his heart. With those girls. With that kiss. With Snape. He feels sore and raw and bleeding. He presses his forehead against the wall, unwilling to turn around. Fuck Remus, please. Remus wants to tell Sirius to stay the fuck away because hasn't he done enough? Did he think Remus needed this? Needed someone else to take him apart? But he can't speak. He tries. His shoulders shake as he tries desperately to shove the sobs back down. Sirius comes up behind him, arms wrapping around him, pulling Remus into his chest. I hate you, Remus thinks. I hate you. I hate you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And then, somehow, Sirius's breath isn't the only thing brushing against Remus's skin. I'm sorry. Sirius kisses his cheek, messy and desperate. I'm sorry. His neck, his jaw. I'm so sorry. It's sad. It all feels so fucking sad and warped. Please. Please, I'm sorry. Sirius kisses the tears off his face. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. It's the first time he's kissed him since James was hurt. And it curdles his stomach. Enough. Remus pushes him off, hands shaking as he turns around to face him, back pressing against the wall. Sirius is a wreck, all pale-faced and red-eyed. You don't get to do that. Not now. Not like this. Not just because you want me to forgive you. No, that isn't... I don't know why I did that. The tone of his voice makes Remus believe him. Which feels worse, if he's being honest. I, I, I don't know why I did that. Remus almost laughs, running a hand over his face, finding himself wishing for the days when the hardest thing about this was Sirius's denial. Brilliant. Great talk. You can go now. Remus. Do... You have anything else to say? Remus is desperately trying to drag his anger back to the surface to block out the rest of it. Because if not, you can go. He sees the flare of irritation in Sirius's eyes. And what? You're just going to hide out in the broom cupboard? Why? Do you need it for something? Remus sees that hit land. It's not as satisfying as it ought to be. I I'm not... There isn't... Sirius grimaces. Clearly frustrated, though, whether it's with himself or Remus, Remus doesn't know. There isn't anyone right now. I don't care. Remus knows that Sirius can tell that was a lie. He's grateful when he doesn't push it. You don't need to stay here. I'll wait. If it's... If you just don't want to be stuck walking back together or whatever. What I want, he almost says, is for you to not argue with me for once in our lives. I want to not look like I've been crying when I walk through the common room. You're the asshole. You get to walk out there looking like a mess. Sirius gives him a quick once-over and really, Remus must look terrible because Sirius doesn't bother arguing after that. Right. Sirius nods, eyes on the ground. Contrition doesn't suit him. Yeah. Okay. And Remus should just let him go. It's what he wants. To be left alone. And yet, for some inexplicable reason, when he sees Sirius's hand on the door, he hears himself say, I told James. Sirius turns stiffly back to look at Remus. Told him? About that you kissed me. 
He isn't sure what kind of reaction he's expecting from Sirius, but in the end he doesn't get much. A stiff nod, Sirius's teeth slipping over his bottom lip. <laughs> Took that well, I expect. Remus doesn't know if that's sarcasm or not. He already knew, I think. Or he had some idea that something was going on. He didn't seem surprised. Just listened. You know how he is. I know how he is. <laughs> Be hypocritical for him to have an issue with it. Remus feels his brow furrow. What do you mean? You know how he's been sneaking out at night? Yeah. Sirius doesn't say anything, just arches his brow and waits for Remus to catch up. Under different circumstances, it probably wouldn't have taken him so long. Oh. Really? Yeah. Took me a bit by surprise, too. After. Lily. A dozen assumptions and moments reconfigure themselves in Remus's head. Yeah. Look, don't, uh, don't go saying anything, alright? The bloke, whoever it is, doesn't want anyone to know. I reckon James wasn't really meant to say anything to me, so... Not great at keeping people's secrets, are you? It's a cheap shot that slips out of Remus before he can think better of it. He watches Sirius absorb the hit. Watches him fight his natural urge to push back. Yeah, uh, well... He turns back to the door but pauses again. If you, uh, if you figure out what you need me to do to make this right, to fix this, let me know, okay? I'll do anything for you, Remus. Those words hit Remus like a blow to the head. Sirius pushes out into the corridor before he has a chance to recover. When they were 11, Sirius found the books Remus's mum had bought him. What are these? Sirius had snatched one off of Remus's bedside table before collapsing next to him on the mattress. It's a book. You read it. A foreign concept to you, I know. Sirius swatted at him. Prick. Remus watched Sirius roll onto his back and hold the book over his face. No, really. What is this? It's a book. Sirius screwed up his face, wrinkling his nose and sticking out his tongue. <laughs> it doesn't look right. Well... <laughs> It's muggle, maybe that's why. No way. Sirius promptly flipped onto his stomach, legs dangling off the side of the bed. Oh, wicked. What's it about? Remus watched Sirius flipping enthusiastically through the pages with a fondness he wouldn't understand for several years to come. Lots of things, really. Uh, friendship, adventure, magic. Sirius's head shot up at that. 
Magic. Muggles have books about magic. What the heck does the minister know about this? Remus rolled his eyes. Well, it's not our magic. Our magic. They don't know that magic is real, so they make up what they think magic would be like if it was. Sirius continued to stare at him for a moment and Remus was sure he'd lost him, but then he smiled. Wicked. Sirius turned back to the book. Remus had watched him for a minute, mouth feeling oddly dry. You can, uh, bor borrow it if you want. Sirius's eyes flicked back to him. Yeah. Yeah. Remus nodded, probably too enthusiastically. Of, of course. <sighs> Thanks. Sirius had smiled again, and Remus had smiled back, feeling an odd bit of pride at having been able to give Sirius something. Ugh. Remus curls onto his side, willing his brain to shut up and leave him alone and let him sleep. Shockingly, this does not prove to be a particularly effective strategy. He flips back onto his back, running his hands over his face a few times before peeking his head out of his bed curtains. He can hear Frank's out of place breathing, and Peter's snoring, and James's predictable absence. Carefully, he slides out of bed, padding towards James's bedside table and opening the drawer. It's been a long time since he looked for Sirius on the map. He doesn't want to start again. Doesn't want to need to. But he still pulls out the faded parchment, sitting down on James's empty bed, wand in hand. He spends a good five minutes like that, just staring at it, trying desperately to convince himself to just put it away and go back to sleep. This isn't going to help. But, of course, he doesn't. I solemnly swear that I'm up to no good. The map unfolds in his lap. He's not sure what he's expecting, but there's Sirius, alone in Frank's old room, apparently not able to sleep either because according to the map he's pacing. Remus watches him, feels something deep inside him ache. You know, for a minute there, I really thought you saw me. It's all very anticlimactic, and predictably does nothing to make him feel better. <sighs> he's about to put the map away when the sudden appearance of two other names catches his attention. James Potter, Regulus Black, standing together somewhere on the seventh floor in the middle of the night. Remus blinks several times before rubbing his eyes, but even when they refocus, the names remain the same, and incredibly close together. Then Regulus starts walking towards the Slytherin common room, James waiting until he disappears around the corner before heading for Gryffindor Tower. There is probably a very valid reason for them being together. Remus tries to reassure himself. Like they just ran into one another, by coincidence, at three in the morning. Stranger things have happened. Except Sirius said, interjects the troublesome voice in his head. But no, no, Remus shuts that thought down because there's no way. He said that James is seeing a... Yes, sure, but that doesn't mean that just because Regulus is a bloke, a bloke James is meeting in the dead of night. At the same time that he confessed to Sirius he was spending with his... His what? Hookup? Boyfriend? Christ, is Regulus Black his boyfriend? No. That's ridiculous. James isn't that stupid. He can't be. James. The boy who can't stand anyone who even entertains the idea of dark magic. Who has been running around since he was eleven trying to rid the world of evildoers. That James Potter would never get involved with Regulus. It isn't possible. Remus quickly taps the map blank. Mischief managed. Shoving it back in the drawer with a little more force than he ought to, considering there are two sleeping people in the room. He's only just closed the curtains around his bed when the door quietly opens, James slipping in as he does most nights. For some reason, Remus's pulse is jackhammering in his chest. He spent months trying to get Sirius to leave it alone. To let James come to them when he was ready, talking him down time and again from following James through the castle. And now, now he thinks maybe that was a mistake. Because if he really is seeing Regulus, then someone should have stopped this. He hears James get into his bed and resist the urge to go over there right now and demand answers. Demand how could he be so fucking stupid? But he can't. Not with Frank. Hell, not even with Peter. Forget the fact that Regulus is, at best, an unpleasant person. 
If Sirius ever finds out, he'll kill him. And not metaphorically. Remus barely represses a groan as he shoves his face into his pillow, as if his own love life wasn't messy enough. Remus watches James the next morning, looking for some sort of sign. A convenient Regulus was here, scribbled across the back of his neck or something. Honestly, it's so ludicrous he keeps wondering if he didn't just make it up. Misread the names. Hallucinate for a few minutes. All right, Mooney. James is standing by the door, double-checking his books. Are you snogging Regulus Black? He nearly blurts out, but luckily, despite his lack of sleep, he still has some self-control. You do look a bit peaky, Moons. Peter looks at Remus, head slightly tilted, concern written across his face. Why Moons? Frank comes out of the washroom, filling the room with the smell of a distinctly new aftershave. It isn't that it's bad. Nothing about Frank is bad. Just wrong. Huh? James tears his eyes away from Remus. Uh, the, the nickname? You, you call him Moon or whatever? Frank hoists his book bag over his shoulder. Where did it come from? We've never called him Moon. I just heard you. Peter's right. We've never called him Moon. No idea what you're on about, Frank. You know what I mean. Frank really doesn't have the stamina to handle them. James nudges Pete with his elbow. You know what he means? Not a clue. You literally just... It's not like a secret. You walk around calling each other nonsense in front of everyone. Frank's eyes go back and forth between their blank faces before shaking his head. <sighs> you know what? Forget it. It's too early for this. <laughs> they all start moving towards the door. James shoots Remus a look, concern flickering back across his face. Moons? Sorry. Yeah. Coming. I bloody heard that! He could just let it go. Should just let it go. Not like he doesn't have enough to worry about as it is. Besides, James is allowed to go off and snog whoever he wants. Even Regulus Black. Remus cringes without meaning to. Anyway, what does Remus know about anything? He isn't exactly a relationship expert. What makes him think he has the right to decide what is and isn't good? Other than the fact that he's caught Regulus and his asshole friends several times picking on younger Muggle-born students. Regulus is never actively involved. Which is smart of him, really. It means he never gets detention. But he is always there, laughing and jeering with the rest of them. Remus's eyes trail to James, who's walking just slightly ahead of him, discussing Quidditch strategies with Frank. He wonders if James knows that. He wonders if he just doesn't care. He shakes his head, trying to get that thought out, angry with himself for even thinking it in the first place. James isn't like that. But then, he hadn't thought Sirius was like that either. And look how that turned out. And then, as if his thoughts are manifesting themselves, he spots a dark head down the hall. It's a stupid split-second decision. Remus starts walking more purposefully, checking over his shoulder to make sure James isn't watching. But he and Frank have already disappeared around the corner. Oi! Black! Regulus looks up from the conversation he'd been having with two other Slytherins, fourth years by the looks of them. Neither of them Rosia a crouch though, which will make things easier. Regulus doesn't say anything, just gives him a cold once-over before arching a dark eyebrow. A word. There's a pause during which Remus thinks Regulus might refuse, and he isn't at all sure what his course of action will be then. Slink back to the Great Hall with his tail between his legs. But then Regulus turns back to his companions before he pulls away from the wall and walks towards him. Am I in trouble? He has his hands in his pockets, face impassive. Remus searches his eyes for any hint of what it is that James sees in him, but he finds nothing. Regulus has none of Sirius's warmth or ease. Everything about him is tight and controlled and superficial. James trusts too easily. Remus isn't interested in pleasantries. He watches Regulus's eyes widen and feels his stomach drop. He really had been hoping he was wrong about this. He sees the good in everyone, even when there isn't any. Know that from personal experience, Lupin. The younger boy quickly recovers from his shock. Remus hates the way those words tie him up in knots. Yes. Remus rarely uses his height to intimidate, but he does so now, hovering over the other boy, making himself big. I want you to know that if you hurt him, I will take you apart, bone by bone. Do you understand? Did he tell you? No. Doesn't know you're here then? Threatening me? Not a threat. 
It's a promise. I know you think you're very tough and scary, that you've become immune to the dark after living in that haunted mansion you call a home. But I promise you, I am worse than anything you have ever faced. And there is nothing I won't do for him. Another moment of silence passes. It's unnerving, the similarities between Regulus and Sirius. Their faces, their eyes, their hair, all so familiar. And yet while on Sirius they're untamable, on Regulus everything has been meticulously manicured and controlled. Forced into a shape it doesn't want to take. You can't scare me, Lupin. But you also don't need to. Oh? I don't want to hurt him. You'll have to excuse me if that doesn't mean much coming from you. Believe what you want. Can I go now? Or are you going to take house points or something? Remus grinds his teeth, contemplating painting several more violent pictures just to really drive the point home. But one look in Regulus's bored grey eyes tells him there would be no point. Go on then. Then after a moment he heads for the Great Hall. Of all the bloody people James could have chosen, and really, he could have had any of them, apart from Lily. He had to choose Regulus. Then again, Remus had to have Sirius, didn't he? What was it people were always saying about glass houses? Idiots. The both of us. Just an old-fashioned love song playing on the radio And wrapped around the music is the sound of someone promising they'll never go 